Shirt Show. All right, let's go. Shirt Show! Talking Shirt! Shirt Show! Talking Shirt! Shirt Show! Talking Shirt! Shirt Show! Shirt Show! All right, episode 33 of Shirt Show. We're talking with Joe from Gorilla Joe Printing Co. in Ohio. Let's go! Yo. Hey, what's up? What's going so what's going on, man? What's Nothing up now? Much. Nothing much. Um, how are you guys? Good. Sunday. We're relaxing, talking shit to each other. So it's yeah. it's nice. Fuck yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that background. Oh, thanks. Are, um, are you like in your office? Yeah, this is one wall of my office. Like so like there's this other sector over here that's uh filled with old uh uh black white Marilyn Manson posters and like old screens for things that meant something to me and a buddy of mine um, uses animal bones and he gets these beetles and they eat the flesh off them and he, they make stuff out of them. So it's just filled with a bunch of weird shit. But <laughs> I just wanted to kind of be in here because uh, yeah. over there is kind of more of a clutterfuck. It's yeah. kind of uh, Incredible Hulk meets – they're not gorillas, which I would expect, you know. Because no, they're, they're, they're hyenas. Hyenas. All right. I'm glad you. I'm glad you could figure out that they weren't gorillas. <laughs> <laughs> but I was expecting, you know, like, hey, well, it sh- I was thinking, of course, it'd be gorillas, right? But they're not. It's well, hyenas. Well, so that's that's the front end of our office. Um, our building's very long and old, and uh, hey, we both have long old buildings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you come into our shop to pick stuff up, that's where all those murals are. But we have murals throughout the whole shop, even our DTG room, and that's the only place that we go to. So. Yeah, so auto reclaim, man. Yeah. Let's, tell us about that. Well, I don't, <laughs> I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, there was an issue. Um, Lotus Holland has a new um, type of system instead of the chains that were going on the sides with the bristles. Yeah, they it's changed like it. these, these bars that go like this Yeah. yeah. and they rub, they rub the screen. <clears throat> now the back bar wasn't like, it was like, it's like a piston and it's like some guy on a bike upstairs, like just going like this, you know, and like they're going up and down. Um, the back one didn't work. So I'm waiting on the part to come in. Um, when you I'm say bar, to, what do you mean bar? It's a, uh, it touches the screen. Like they like used a, to, they used to have a chain. Yeah. And that I, I don't know, they got rid of the chain system and now it's just two bars. that go. Oh, I see what you're saying. But it's still, it still brushes. It's just yes, bars exactly. instead of chain. Exactly. chain. Yeah. Bars okay. instead okay. of chain. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. yeah. So, so, and like I said, so the bottom like runs on like a bicycle and it goes like this. Um, but the bottom one. <laughs> I love this. I love the acting one. out that you're doing. <laughs> well, I mean, I was and they're going back, like this. I'm sitting back there and I'm like, <laughs> oh, fuck. What the fuck am I going to do? You know, like, <clears throat> so. And Alex from Easy Way is like, <sighs> you know, and he, they're like, are you freaking out? I'm like. Oh, I know it's going to get fixed. I was like, we've never had this before anyways. This is just making things easier. It's not like we have 10,000 shirt run and we have our first auto that we got to learn right. real quick. So anyways, um, the parts are coming in um, that I just need to kind of fix. Something might have been damaged in shipping, um, but we're actually still using it with just one bristle and um, just kind of bumped up the ratio of 701 in the first chamber. And it's... I mean, still getting rid of the ink, you know, and coming out pretty clean. So, um, so they, this is something that arrived and you installed or they installed it. They installed it. Okay. We just, we just had to run the electrical airlines and plumbing to it. And then you had easy way come out and set it all up for you. Well, easy way. Um, Alan and Alex came out to make sure that the, ratios were correct they wanted to visit some other shops too so they were here for a couple days um you know but then the the lotus holland actually installed it right so So you had the the legend alex out there yeah my my hero yeah the mustache this so yeah (laughs) yeah last monday i was like do you guys want to come over to my house before we go out to eat like (laughs) So they came over. It was like having friends over after school mm. and like, <laughs> I don't know. It was a lot of fun, yeah, but yeah. That. So the auto reclaim is, is, is actually awesome. Even as is, um, the chemicals work great. Um, uh, I'm just waiting on the parts. I think they're going to be here Tuesday and they sent me a video 
how to, how to install it, but I was watching, um, my tech do it. So it, it seems really easy. I just, you know, I was like, this isn't going to work, avoid my warranty. Is it, you know? And they said, no. Right. So. I've had things like that happen before. Like I had our second, um, sprint came and when you order it, you order which way the belt goes, you know? <clears throat> okay. Um, oh, okay. And like, there, so there's a side where the control panel is and you say, I want the belt going that way or I want the belt going that way. Well, <laughs> we said that, but it, when it got here, it got, something got mixed up in translation or in ordering, not on our end, but it showed up and we started putting it together. It was going the wrong way. We actually <laughs> had, we had that not that long ago because when we got the split belt, we, we had one of the belts for a little while and then all of a sudden it started to rip. So it was like a faulty, shitty belt or whatever. And I called the m and parts department lady to get a new belt and she was like, she was like, yeah, well, what way does it go? Does it go right to left or left to right? And I was like, well, well, what, I was like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> and then the funny part is I'm out there in the shop. I'm like, I'm like, well, if you're, I told her, I was like, well, if you're standing at the control panel, the belt is going from right to left. And she's like, all right, well, what if you're like, she couldn't get what I was saying. I literally had to send her pictures with arrows. And I was like, it goes this way. When I ordered mine, I actually took a picture and put arrows on it. Yeah, that's what, that's it, what I had to it, do because I was so, to him, right. and it was probably something stupid. Like, like there's the obvious way of like, it goes this way. But like my mind, as soon as she said that, I just had a super dumb moment. And I was like, I have no fucking idea what you're saying. <clears throat> have you ever installed yeah. a door in a, in a room and it opens yeah. in or out or right to left and all that shit? I usually yeah. get that wrong too. <laughs> sure. And it's embarrassing because it's like one of those things where it's like, you know, like not that my dad's ever asked me to go grab him a wrench that I didn't know, but like, it's like one of those moments where you're just like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't the, my, what? the worst, the worst thing for me is when you call a tech and he's like, like, they don't know what it is at first. And they're like, do you have like a, do you have like a multimeter? And as soon as they say that, I'm like, Oh my God. Cause like, I don't know jack shit about electric. And they're always like, Hey, go in this panel with all these scary looking fucking boxes and like poke around at stuff. And I have like fat sausage fingers. Sure. So they're like, they're like, Oh, un undo this screw, this screw, this screw, pull the wire out, clean it up, put it back in. And I'm like that, that wire is like a human hair. Like I can't fucking grab it. Yeah. I can't I, like, I don't understand what you want me to do. Um, but yeah, we had that a little while ago and it's just like super frustrating to be like, poking around in there with meters and taking wires apart and everything else. Well, so. spe speaking of electric, like <clears throat> you said you had a brown dryer before, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So was it brown or was it black? The actual dryer? Yeah. It was brown. Okay. So I have a brown dryer, but it's black. I bought it from a, a company that um, isn't a company anymore, but he also absorbed companies it's, I mean, it's like a 72 inch belt. It's 23 feet long. I bought it for 5,500 bucks. I mean, right. but it's like 150 amps of electric, like, but it acts like a gas dryer. Um, it's the only one made from them. Uh, but I'm kind of, and it was made in 2015. So it's only six years old. I'm having like these, like, uh, like these, things pop up. Like when things kind of go wrong with it, they pop up on the computer screen and stuff. Um, same thing. And I called Brown and like, they were like, well, it could be just something that's like kind of faulty. Do you, do you, do you really want to fix it? Or do you want to just kind of like, <laughs> you know, as, as long as everything's curing, right. Which it sounds is, like a dad thing. They're <laughs> like, Hey, yeah. I don't feel like helping you with this. So are you all right with it? Just not being right. No, they, no, they were, they were cool. They were cool <laughs> doing anything I wanted. They actually wanted me to trade it in for like a firefly. But like, I was like, no, I'm not like trying to like, you know, throw you under the bus. I'm like, I just, uh, I, 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 you know, I got this for such a cheap price and it like, it works really, really good. Um, so like, I don't know, even if I used it for a year, but, um, you know, What's so. The, was, well, I guess the biggest thing is why did, why did you go with electric for that big of a dryer? Uh, because of the price, mm. um, because of the price, but is your um, electric bill insane? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask I mean, you I, 150 amps. Is that single phase or no, it's triple phase and 150 triple. I wow, used to phase. have it, it's on 150 breaker, but I, it draws, I think a hundred to 120. When so it like, cycles, like it's yeah. Yeah. saying. Yeah. 
Yeah. But like we, we used to have an electric dryer, a big one, not anywhere near as big as like our gas dryers, but we had an electric dryer and my electric bill was like three grand. And okay, I was like, mine's never, mine's never been that. My biggest one was 1800 bucks. And that was in last December, this past December. Right. Um, but I'm, well, mine, I say three grand, but three grand is, I do it like every two months. It's not like monthly. So it was probably more like 1500 bucks a month or whatever. That's, yeah. That's, but I still, I went from when I got rid of the electric dryer and I went to gas, my electric bill was 600 bucks. Holy shit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, there's, there's a company in Pittsburgh, <clears throat> which is only an hour away that has a sprint, I believe. And I think it's a pretty new one too. I think I might, you know, see. Do, it's you, do you guys have natural gas or can you just yeah. do propane? Okay. See, I don't have natural gas in my town, so I have to do propane, but even that my propane bill is like a hundred bucks a week. So yeah, for it's sure. still, but the thing is, is a, it's better to use gas anyway, if possible, just because like forced air and the way it works and everything else. Um, but it ended up being cheaper for me anyway to use gas versus electric. So my only thing with buying this dryer was the fact that <clears throat> it was convenience made for, and price. Well, yeah, but like it was like made for a DTG shop, so it has the convection like forced air in it. Like it, it's not. I'm not talking like a um, you know some of the other dryers out there that have like a little fan. I mean, it it really acts like a like a gas dryer, but you know, it was just kind of like one of those things where I was just like, uh, I mean, I, you know, for I mean, the price. Yeah. Like at 5,500, it's almost, it's a no brainer. You know, you got 72 yeah. inch belt, it's 20, whatever feet. I don't know what the heat chamber is, but it sounds like it's, if it's a 20 it's, something it's, foot you yeah, know, dryer, it's, it sounds good. Yeah. And I don't know. It's, I mean, that's a crazy, crazy cheap price, you know? It so, is. I mean, yeah. And the only thing job. that sucks, well, thanks. But like, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll use it for as long as I can, but, uh, um, the, the, the heating element clearance from the belt is super small. So, you know, I got to factor in the time it takes to actually put, you know, push that down. Um, as opposed to just maybe throwing a hoodie on and just kind of going like this. Very you know? first dryer I bought was a 24 belt, 24 wide, 11 foot long. And it was more money than that. It was a workhorse. <laughs> It was uh, it was a national. Have you ever heard of them? They yeah, they're, oh, yeah, they're yeah. not in business anymore. I think they're. Uh, I have a hat years. press. I sold my old employee. Yeah, yep. I think they they were built and manufactured in Kansas. Okay, but um, it's called National, and it was basically just three flashes in a row, like three pretty big, you know, IR panels, um, and then a conveyor belt that had a temp control on it. I loved it. I bought it brand new, but it was more than fifty five hundred. It was like seven thousand bucks or something. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, 5,500, it's crazy great. So it, it is. I mean, like I think the electrical cost, I don't know, almost as much as it. And that now like, you know, thinking back, it's like, I'm never going to put anything that's that big of an electrical, you know, what right. I need there ever again. So it's like, right. I don't know. you know what our biggest draw power wise is? What? The Ecotex? A AC. <laughs> oh man, uh, you have a, you're fancy fans, fancy fancy you know, I only have AC in our uh, uh, offices, the front mm -hmm. office and the back office. Yeah, St. Louis, you know, well, it's it's hot. And um, what's the weather like now? Well, right now it's not, but it's it's probably in it's in the 30s or something. But yeah, here. Too. But I mean, you know, uh, n another six weeks or so when we're in spring and. And it gets really hot and humid here. And so we, we have, it's climate controlled and, and our, we have, I have 11 AC units, like commercial rooftop AC units. And it's, it's all, the entire building is comfortable, <laughs> but yeah, that costs a lot of money. And then my second power, I think the second one would be flashes. We just have all quartz flashes and there's a ton yeah. of them. And then like Dylan said, third would probably be Ecotex because it, mm -hmm. it's got a hundred amp. Like, what's the Lotus? What did you, uh, you said you spent a lot or you had to run power to it? Yeah. I mean, that was only, I mean, that was like 600 bucks or something like that. I don't know. Um, you know, I already had, <clears throat> we have two air compressors, even though like we have, we have three autos. Well, three, I call, I say it three and a half autos. Um, Cause we have a, um, a ASP tag press, but um, two of the autos run on air and electric, but um, the one is just, is all electric, but you know, is that the is that the volt? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, do, you, do you like that press? You know what? Yeah, I mean, 
I had someone approach me with a good, good opportunity that for a shop that went out of business in Columbus, um, got a really crazy deal on a, uh, the, that press, uh, a dryer. You tell me it was 5,500. No, it was, <laughs> it was a little bit $5,500 for everything I have. <laughs> so like, <clears throat> you know what? I don't know. Like some things that anyways, so like, so that I bought this <laughs> shop out, I got anything that I wanted. I basically cherry picked through everything, got about 400 screens. Um, most of them, I mean, you know, when we tested them out after we reclaimed them, they were over our threshold of Newton's, which is 17. Um, you know, we got a bunch of other stuff. Um, and so when we, you know, installed it, everything was cool. And the dude agreed to give me a year's worth of work and which he did. And it was over that. So it was like, I bought this, you know, shop, let's just say $30,000 he gave me way over that within a year, not saying that all that money was going towards paying that off. Cause I mean, I, I just paid for it, but I got work with it too. So it kind of right. made sense. So it was like, do I need three presses all the time? Absolutely not. We don't have, you know, a whole shift doing three presses all the time. Uh, it was just kind of like a, it was almost kind of like, right. hey, it was an opportunity. This? Yeah. You want to buy this lawnmower? Um, just cut my yard for like, I don't know half what you would normally <laughs> charge and you can have this really sick lawnmower <laughs> and like, yeah. you know, so I don't know. That's kind of how. So, it so anyway, that, that shop that you got the stuff from, they, they were all Anatol. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, uh, except for actually our live press, um, thing. Cause we used to have a really shitty live press, um, uh, that I bought from like eBay. Um, like the real shitty one. Um, so he had a Riley Hopkins, which is basically like better than the first press I ever got. So yeah. we got that and, um, you know, a bunch of other stuff, but that was like the only other thing that wasn't Anatol. Yeah. Do you, do you like the Anatols? They work pretty good for you. Yeah. You know what, man? Like when I first started searching autos and stuff, like I didn't really know about much, um, just kind of looked into everything and, uh, what my needs were at the time were kind of fulfilled by who I talked to about right. Anatol. Mm -hmm. And I'm still kind of like, yeah, I mean, like, you know, I, I ran other presses and like some of the other presses were, I don't know, not as, I guess I, I, I I've done toggle switches and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I just wasn't, you know, I don't know. I have, I have nothing bad to say about Anatol at all. I just like my my local rep in uh, Rochester, uh, Davis International. That's what they they sell is Anatol. Uh -huh. And AJ AJ is always trying to get me to buy an Anatol. Anytime I got anything, he was like, "Oh, you should check out the Anatol. You should check out the Anatol." And I ended up telling him because I got in between M and R and Anatol. Like I, I wasn't gonna. I don't think I was anywhere near as close with buying an Anatol as I was with getting an M and R. But I told him straight up, I was like. I don't have anything bad to say about Anatol. I just don't have anything good to say. Like, I don't hear people be like ranting and raving about their Anatol. Like, yeah, probably print shirts and it's great. But that was the, the main reason why I just didn't like go any further with it. But I do like follow them on social media or just like I've seen them at shops I really respect. And people are like, yeah, we like it. It works. It does. It's great. And then right. I see some of this cool new stuff they're making. And I'm like, oh man, that's a pretty cool feature that like nobody else has. Like, but you can, I think they have a new one where you can like pick the whole arm up. So you yeah. can like do other things yeah. with it. I was like, I oh, you're talking fast. about the, like the seventh head. Like if you have a yeah. six, if, like you if you're running color, one operator, mm -hmm. you can put a head right before you or whatever. So you're right. using one palette. And I was like, oh, it's pretty cool. So that would have been perfect. Somebody, like when I was out you, of my garage, that'd been perfect. Right. And that's yeah. what I mean. Like if you, if you were running two guys, you could just lift that, that arm up that's and then neat. you can right. keep printing. And there was just like other features they had and other cool things. I was like, I was like, good for them that they're kind of like doing things differently. They're not just doing the, you know, we got to do exactly what M&R or rock or whatever they're doing. They're just kind of like their own company doing their own thing. And it's right. like, That'd be yeah. Awesome. I mean, like they, they've always treated me really well. Um, I know that just like any business, you know, you go through like different techs or, you know, whatever, but I mean, like 
everybody's super responsive on the phone. Like, like, you know, I've never changed a stroke cylinder before, like way back in the day, you know, like, so they're, they're FaceTiming me, showing me how to do it. You know, that kind of thing. Like, that's all I really want. I just want somebody to have my back when some fucking shit goes wrong. And like, they've always done that. <clears throat> and they um, stick to their word. And, and yeah, and they do. And like, just recently I got approached by, um, the, the sales rep in our area. And like, uh, because I've ever since you guys started talking about the MNR hothead, you know, I looked on Anatol's site to see if there's anything like that. They didn't have anything like that. So I actually got a hold of MNR because I have an eye image. So like, I mean, I have, you know, you know, I mean, some MNR stuff. Uh, and I was like, Hey, will this hothead work for my Anatol? Um, you know, but Anatol just came out with something and it's, it's like pretty much the same thing. Um, and they're actually going to give me one to try out and test. And I'm just going to, I don't know, make some videos of like trying it out and right. you know, that kind so of you're, thing. You're beta testing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like I think it's available. I'm pretty sure the, I'm pretty sure the Stampinator works on an Anatol. Okay. But I mean, that's different. It's basically a heat press versus yeah. something running back and forth. See, um, I think what I'm getting, um, is, uh, it might be something similar to the hot head where it just, it moves. Right. It goes in like a, you put it in like a squeegee position. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. No, that's cool. I had yeah. somebody reach out to me about that because they didn't have an M and R and they asked if the hot head would work on their press. And I, and I, um, I found out that it, it probably will, but I don't think they guarantee it, you know? So right. I think the biggest thing with the hot head is just like you need it to be able to clamp in like an MNR yep. style squeegee, but yeah. also you need to have some kind of holder to hold the actual uh, like brain of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, which is different. The MNR one, press. right. And the MNR one is made to like fit right on the head. It like has a little bracket. Mm -hmm. But like if you didn't have that, it's just a matter of making a bracket, like something to yeah. hold it there. Right. So it's like the same thing with they didn't have a bracket made yet for the Cobra. Right. Cause I, I remember Ron bought one, Ron bought one and he was like, yeah, I can't use this yet because I don't have the bracket. And then they ended up just like fabricating a bracket to make it work. But, um, yeah, but you also have the Anatol, uh, like the turnabout, like the MNR turnabout. Yeah. Right? yeah. See, I think that one looks, I think that one looks cooler. Like if I was to buy one, cause that one has like a yeah, whole touch screen. LCD touchscreen and everything. Yeah. I was like, fuck that one's cooler. I Plus mean, with that one, you can do gallons too, right? Oh, you can do quartz. Yeah, see that's. I don't know why awesome. the fuck you do that. Like, like by the time you you set all the shit up and like clean the blade <laughs> off, like why the, get the fuck? You know what? Unless you're doing a bunch of courts or something. I was honestly, but, I honestly was going to ask my dad to see if he could make me one. I kind of want to just get like a a motor that'll run slow that I can put on my ink mixing table and run uh like like you were saying quartz but i don't yeah. want to have like an arm that goes up and in and all that shit i just literally want it to hold the court and spin and i could just take my spatula yes. and stick it in and hold it while it spins so i don't have to right. sit there and go like don't this you feel like such a pussy when that part of your hand hurts so bad <laughs> you're just like i'm just saying like like if i'm sitting there and i'm whipping i'm whipping and whipping yeah. and whipping like if i could just put it on a thing and hit go and then just hold a spatula yeah. in it I mean, it makes you, it's, it's, it's totally lazy, but it's like, it'd be awesome. Like it's, if it was just right there because, next to the scale. Because here's the thing, like, it's not lazy. And I would buy that if, if, you know, because like, if you're mixing, you know, like the girl who mixes our ink or myself or whoever, like she might have, she always looks ahead at all of her work orders to make sure that, you know, what inks are need mixed. She always checks everything off. We highlight anyways. Um, if she doesn't have to do this for so long, you right. know, and just kind of put it on a thing and just kind of hold it there. Like, right. can you call her one arm Sally? Cause it's like one arm's way bigger than the other one. Yeah. I mean, like her, her name's Sierra. So you could be like one arm Sierra. Oh, hell yeah. Whatever. See, yeah, well, it's like, not just a, it's not just a wimpy thing. Like, oh, I, I don't want to do it. It's more about time. Like he yeah, just said, like yeah. if you're trying to go fast, then it's faster. And then also what if you have to mix three or four or six colors, you know, like, yeah. sure. well, that's the thing. Killer after the first, and, and, after a couple, like, it is. And that would be better than a blade you have to change in every time, clean right. out, you know. Right. That's what I'm saying. If you're only. using the actual spatula, you're going to use in the ink anyway. Yeah. Like if you just exactly. held it in and it's, I love it. it's fun. Yeah. I love so it. the three of us will make it, we'll patent it. And then. <laughs> What was your idea? Happen. I just said I'd buy it. <laughs> all, right, so I, all right. So you just forfeited your, your right to it. So <laughs> yeah, right it's mine, mine and mine alone. Yeah. But I think it's, it's totally doable. Just getting a motor that can step down. Um, but 
I don't know. I it's mean, just... I, I, I think if, I mean, I don't know what, what the M and R uh, turnabout can do, but like, I mean, if, if mine can hold courts, it can happen, but it's, it's big and lunky. So it's like, yeah, I feel like the, the main, like we only ever leave white in the turnabout. Like I yeah, know, I know you could change it out and you could do other things with it, but realistically, the only ink I need to keep mixing throughout the day is white. And that's yeah. all I'm ever going to put in there. So like I said, if you had a little one that just like bolted to your tape, your ink mixing station or something yeah. up where you are, like that would be cool to have both, but I would never like mix. Yeah, we've inks. decided that you really need to, because just like you said, white just lives on top of ours. Right. And so you know what the biggest, the worst thing is, is when you want to mix a gallon is that you have gallon. to pull the white off. You know, right. uh, they have to pull the five of white off. It's one. heavy as shit, and you got to pull it off, and then all this kind of stuff. If you just had this turnabout for the white, and then you had another one for everything else, I mean, I think that's the way to do it. I know, you know it yeah. costs money, but it's funny too because <laughs> that's that's the only time I've ever wanted to take the white out is when we were doing it like a I don't know what it was like a ten thousand piece run, and we were just doing like Kelly Green ink. And I was mixing gallons and that's when you're like, your arm fucking hurts is when you're trying to custom Pantone and mix a full gallon oh, yeah. and you're just like churning and you're like, oh, this is going to take me a half hour just to stir. That's when, and like I said, it would be awesome to have something you could just sit there and, and do, but I don't know. There probably is something out there, but not that I know of anyway. So Joe, oh, we, uh, we skipped the, how'd you get started part? Well, <laughs> well, how'd do you get it started? Now. Uh, yeah, how'd you get started printing t-shirts? Okay, let's so, make sure Andy's recording first before you do that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like it says it is. All right, um, yeah, we're yeah, we're recording. Okay. So when I was in high school, I was about fifteen. Um, there was this really hot fucking teacher. She had like like cat glasses. She was walking around. You know, I was like, holy living fuck. Um, what does she teach? Because I want to take the class. <laughs> and it was. It was silk screen printing. And I was like, what the fuck is silk screen printing? And so <clears throat> I took it anyways, because somebody said that you can like, I was in a band, so you could print your own band shirts if you want to, just like everybody else. Um, so I took it and it was like, not what I expected. I was like, oh fuck, we're stapling this shit to fucking old wood, you know, this is- So you were making screens. We were making screens. You know, we had the Ruby lift. We had to get the X-Acto knife and cut it out. You know, all that shit, um, all within like the same week or two, like I wasn't even like a full band at the time. I was just kind of like, oh, I'm just going to make some shirts. That was when like you make like flyers for shows that don't even exist. You just like are so excited. So like I met this other dude in a mall and <laughs> their school had emulsion so they can make really cool stuff. So I did my thing. They did their thing when we all joined a band and made a band and stuff. So we did that. We did it like that. <clears throat> um, we did that for as long as we could. Um, and then we kind of changed our name. We started going on tours, um, all that other stuff. I bought a speedball kit uh, because at the time, a lot of grind bands and power violence bands and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, they were printing their own stuff in their basement. And like, you could tell it was like, I have a lot of them, like one of the band's daughters, another band circle takes square. Like the, the, the actual print is like, it almost looks like paint. So it's like, I know it was the speedball, the kit. So I was like really intrigued by that, how you could be so popular, like online, like a lamb goat and like all that other stuff. And, and print your merch in this with a speedball kit. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. like when we'd go on those weekend commando tours, when I was like a senior, you know, bust out of school on Friday, if I even went to school on Friday and driving to New York city or Philadelphia. And, you know, I got this like, 50 shirts of, you know, a bunch of stuff that I screen printed myself would sell that. Um, when our van got bigger, we actually had to use a bigger company. Um, they, you know, our label started providing some of our merch. They never paid for it, but um, they would help us out, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and we did a lot of tours like overseas and that kind of stuff. We get merch printed over there because it's a lot cheaper to just pick it up. Um, but then like when I first started doing my thing now was probably 2009 or something like that. Um, I was in a band and, and, uh, lived with all the guys in the band and, <clears throat> um, I, you know, I was kind of like, remembered the 
all the stuff that I used to do at my mom's house in the basement. And like, I was like, Hey, I could print our shirts. You know, like we have like these like five, six songs. We're start playing shows. So let me go see if I have that, still have that kit in the basement. We can, you know, kind of just figure it out. So I went there like my mom's not a hoarder, but she hardly throws anything away. And like, she threw that away. So I, I rebought. So I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll just use a car squeegee. And so I printed <laughs> like a really small batch of shirts. Um, but then I got in some trouble. So fast forwarding, like a month or two after I went to court and stuff, they were like, all right, so you're going to probably go to jail unless you pay these fines off as fast as possible. And I'm like, okay. Um, I had one job at the time where I was doing inventory control at like the worst place I've ever been to in my entire life. I hated my life. I actually got a job delivering Chinese. I went back to my pizza shop job delivering pizza, but then it still wasn't enough because nobody was like, okay, I'm going to give you all the hours because you need them. Like they were just like, all right, dude, you're like a, you know, so I started screen printing. So like I, I found a guy on uh, Craigslist and I don't know why I was just like, uh, I guess I'll just spend all my savings on screen printing equipment. But a guy was selling some pretty decent stuff. Though, so I thought for like 600 bucks. So I spent the 600 bucks in my savings account. Um, and it was one of those like blue magnet ones. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking what about? Are the mag yeah, the magnets hold it up. Yeah, it, it was actually not terrible for one color stuff. So, you know, bought some screens, some squeegees, didn't know shit. He gave me pirated versions of Photoshop and Illustrator. So I was just like, cool, I'm set. And uh, I was like, okay, now what the fuck do I do? So I bought some screens. I bought some used screens on eBay, cleaned them in, a, in the car wash, just like Andy used to do. Like I, you know. Where was your shop right now? Oh, oh. This shop you're talking about, are you? Okay, I'm so sorry. Like I, you know, this was in basically a frat house. It wasn't like I wasn't in, I wasn't in uh, college. Mm. I wasn't anything, but it was, I was like 20 something years old. Um, in a garage of the frat house. No, no, no. It was in the, the basement. Okay. Yeah. All right. Hold on before you go any further. <laughs> you guys, you guys always talk about cleaning the screens at a car wash. Mm. What fucking car wash do you go to where you take dirty ass plastic all screens and fucking clean them in the car wash? Sketchy because ones. every car wash Sketchy I've ever ones. been to, <laughs> every car wash I've ever been to, there's always like a couple people waiting. Nah. I'm saying I, if I pulled up with a truck and pulled screens out and fucking put them up against the thing and I sat there and pressure washed screens, the people behind me would murder me. Maybe now, no. but like at the time I had like... I think I had a 305, which who the fuck needs a 305 when you first start out? Um, and then like, I don't know, six, 18 by twenties. So it was like, you know, when I'm learning exposure and stuff, like, you know, I mean, I'm only bringing seven at a time, so it doesn't take very long. Right. And I had, some I didn't, I brought like 50, but are you but, sitting uh, there? Are you, you sitting know, there like, like, like spraying on ink cleaners scrubbing pressure washing scrubbing no, because or you're just blasting shit with the pressure washer yeah i was yeah <laughs> okay. no i mean the emulsions on there and there's some ink you know left i would love yeah, to you, see some dude in his like white mercedes pull into that car wash to clean his car and get like plastisol on his car from well, the asshole who used to clean screens in there probably uh, happened <laughs> <laughs> Probably happened, but you know, it was, uh, it was, I used to take him to a sketchy car wash. There weren't any people, uh, like working there, Didn't give you a know, show just put your quarters in there. And then I would park right, you know, I wouldn't pull in the bay. So I'd park in front of the bay, you know what I mean? And so, and then I'd line the screens in the bay and I would just, it was pretty fast. Like I could do 50 sure. pretty, pretty damn fast because you just kind of line them all up. You know what I mean? You're not doing three or five at a time or whatever you're doing right. them all. And nobody would ever pull behind me because I was, I was pulled right in that bay. They was like, Oh, I don't know what the hell this guy's doing, but I'm not waiting, you know? And so they would just pull in the other ones. And uh, it was right. awesome. Like that was the only way, just like cleaning that was body the way parts. to do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, like, I mean, so the, the area we live in, like, I don't live in like a, I don't know, like people, people clean their trucks when they got done hunting and stuff. So it's like, right. I don't know. There's like, you know, excavator stuff on the ground. There's guts on the ground and there's yeah. emulsion on the ground. I always hated that when I pulled in to clean my screens, if anybody had any yeah. dirt in there, I'd be like, come on guys. Right. <laughs> you know, come like, on. You left it dirty. I'm going to put fucking I'm plastic on the place. Exactly. I'm going to get dirt and mud on my screens. This sucks. Yeah. 
but yeah but anyway okay. yeah that um it's so <laughs> different now isn't it now look at you you had you were cleaning screens in a garage and now you got yourself a lotus auto recleaning <laughs> right right i mean my, my biggest my biggest accomplishment though was um like literally when I, I i felt like i crossed the threshold of like um a uh, piece of shit into this is career possibly was um one 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 christmas time you know like december november i can't remember um i was working christmas is in december well, right right but like <laughs> but I, th- I think i started in november um so like you know i was like okay cool let's let's jump on the bandwagon of a bunch of uh you know like christmas parody shirts like for like you know cousin eddie from whatever and at the time i was just like all right cool so like let me just try this so like I didn't have a smartphone at the time, but I would use my company email that that the company I worked for, for all my eBay stuff. And like, I'd go back to my desk and see three more orders. I'm like, Oh, holy shit. So like, so in one season for Christmas, I made enough money to buy a little buddy, which was like at the time, I think 24, no, 2,100 bucks. And that to me, having a conveyor dryer was the absolute, like I made it. I, uh, I was talking to Amy from Threadbare the other day. It was probably like Thursday and she posted this, uh, pair of sweatpants on her stories that like, uh, I guess one of her employees just does like a clothing line on the side. And there was sweatpants where I thought it was a joke because it was literally like both pockets printed the front, like four locations on each, like top by the pocket like knees and then like lower and then it was like the same thing on the back where it was like both pockets and like i was like that is a nightmare like whatever that is i want no part of it and she's like it's so funny because like it's my one of my employees did it on the side and apparently it like went viral on like twitter or something and he sold like she told me he was selling them for like 150 bucks a piece and he ended up selling like enough to like that day to literally like buy a car and I was like, that's insane. Um, yeah. I, uh, fuck. <laughs> so you when telling me your, the story uh, of things. Just I was going to ask Dylan, I was going to ask you when your, when like, was your moment that you realized like, oh, this is going to work, you know, like. Instantly. <laughs> <laughs> of course I, was like, I knew. This is what I, I'm going to do. I, I knew you were going to say that. And so I just wanted you to be able to say it. I was a professional right off the bat. <laughs> His yeah. very first order he made. Right. Right. It's a 5,000 piece order for Nike. Very first thing I did. <laughs> and um, it went smoothly. Right. It went perfectly fine. No right, issues. Right, right. And then, uh, but real talk, there was, uh, order. well, my story is a little weird though, because I, I never started off printing. I started off, uh, like reselling. So my first year to year and a half to two years was just outsourcing, t-shirt stickers and buttons. So when I did that and then I moved to Atlanta, like sold that company to the company I went and worked for. um, And then I worked there for two years too. I went in already as like, like head of sales, basically. Like I already knew what I was doing, selling shirts. So to me, the, the validation of knowing the company that I was outsourcing to wanted me bad enough to buy my company and move me there. That to me felt like, okay, I, I know what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Like someone else thinks I know what I'm doing enough to, to send me there. And then when I was there, just seeing how much the company grew while I was there because of the sales I was bringing in, um, that to me again, showed me like, this is possible. You know what I mean? Like I know enough of what I'm doing. So when I decided to move back to New York and start upstate, like literally I hit the ground, like I'm already a company, like I'm already a thing. I already know what I'm doing. So jokingly, yeah, I say like I was a success right off the bat, but like I literally had a, I had a huge head start. Like before I started upstate, I was already there. Like I knew how to sell. I knew who to contact. I knew reps. I knew everything. So pretty much I just slapped a new name on it and starting getting customers. But the problem was, is I went from selling to customers when it was a shop that had autos and had, you know, 15 employees to me and another dude in a one car garage. Right. So it was like, I had the same selling mentality of both places, but I was like, oh yeah, we can do that. You know, like 
500 piece four color front four color back and it's like you're using a silver press and a mnr right uh like small super small dryer um counting shirts in the grass outside like you, it well, was like, one of those like you fake it till you make it like we 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 never like lied to anybody and so when we were doing we just never said like we're not a massive shop that will same here anything you want it's yeah, like I mean, you just make what you can in that sa- in that space until you can't make it there anymore because you just don't fit and then okay. we bought a bigger place and then eventually you buy more equipment and so on so that was my moment i guess was just like knowing that another company wanted me bad enough when I was out of uh, my garage, I always thought that that was like a negative thing. Like I would never mention it, you know, when I was either selling or delivering or whatever, I would never mention it. But um, if somebody asked, I would say, yeah, well, I'm out of, I'm out of my garage right now. Yeah. You're home-based business. Yeah. I'm home-based business. And you know, they really, it actually played in my favor a lot of times because when you're small and you're you're hustling, you know, and you're, and you're trying to make it. People recognize that like as a story, like that was the real story and you're not, you're not bullshitting. And I actually got tons of business sent my way because people were like, Hey, this guy, you know, he did, does a great job and he's, and he's trying to, you know, become a, become a shop or whatever. And I got stuff sent to me because, because of that. So I always, I think that I should have come out earlier, you know, about, or just told people that I'm out of my garage. And I I always feared them finding out like, oh, now we're not going to do work with you because you're, you know, out of your garage, but it it actually worked the other way around. Um, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people market it that way though. Like not necessarily the garage thing, but they market the like artisanal, like, you know, it's, it's hand pulled and they, they try to make it as like crafty as possible to make it sound like you're like, you know, you got like fucking the lights dimmed and candles lit and you're like yeah. passionately <laughs> printing their shirts. I mean, nothing against that. Like, dude, do, no, no, no. do whatever you got to do. But the thing is, is a lot of people are like, oh, it's I feel like some places get that in their head that it's like so hands on when you're manually printing. And then as soon as you get an auto, you're like, oh, you're a fucking big company. You barely have to touch them anymore. It's like, dude, there's so much you still have to manually do on an auto. Like, yeah tweaking everything like literally the only thing you're not doing is spinning the machine and pulling the squeegee like you're doing yeah. everything else and and hands are so inconsistent i mean like right you know my wife owns a salon and like i mean like she, she was having problems for a month where like she was like i'm gonna have to have carpal tunnel surgery and like you know uh her back always hurts because she has to lean over people and all that other shit so it's like right. i mean uh, you know machines aren't bad yeah, yeah, no, it's just consistency. Like you with the auto, it's just kind of like, okay, I can consistently make 500 shirts the exact same way. Right. Like the machine doesn't get tired um, and I can do your order a lot faster and everything else. So it's just right. eventually when you can, I feel like everybody should, when it's right, automate if you if you can. So yeah. I so have yeah. um, on your Instagram, you have these um, really rad, uh, looks like they're just cardboard cards that you um, spread adhesive on when after you've exactly <laughs> what I was going to ask about. And then they have these so, faces drawn on them. I, so, so, okay. So you, you, I was trying to rack my brain about hacks and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. This isn't a hack. Um, like, but like, it's like just a thing. Like, um, you got to okay, explain so, it though. What the hell is happening? Yeah. <laughs> so when we, when we use web adhesive, um, this is, these are cleanup cards, right? When we use web adhesive, we just start like wiping the palette with why. It. So that's my question is like, those are, those are cool, but why? Yeah. Cause whenever we put missed it, missed adhesive down or web adhesive down, we're never carding it at all. Okay. So like we just spray it on there and go. So I, you're, this is the first time I've ever seen anybody like spread it. The reason why we don't do it for mist, we only do it for web adhesive. It's because, and I'm not going to sound gross, but I've had a customer who's a contract customer come back to us and say, um, yeah, we have a soccer mom, basically, um, a Karen, who's asking about the stains inside of her hoodie. Right. And I'm like, stains? What do you mean stains? She's like, or he said, they're they're like the, the, the snail trails of stuff. And I said, okay, right. well, that's just from our, uh, you know, miss adhesive. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, if someone's not careful, they're going to drag that bottom part of the hoodie across right. the pallet and it's going to get that 
men looking shit on the bottom of it. So anyway, you're, you're webbing the palette and then you're carting it to flatten it out. So it's not like as gooey in certain spots. Yes. And then obviously the sides and stuff like that too. Right. Like we just do it real quick. We, we, you know, yeah, we just do that real quick. And all we're doing is just kind of like just getting that like extra wetness off of it, I guess. Right. No, I get it. Stuff. It just collects on there. And then well, it's kind of it's kind of a win win because the reason why people use web over mist is because mist is like so light and in the air, it'll get all over your press and well, in your this lungs. This is only for hoodies. Right. No, exactly. No, I okay, get you. Okay. I'm just saying like the difference between using four hoodies is using a mist and a web is a web is concentrated and it goes specifically right at the palate. It's yeah. not in the air. The guy on press isn't breathing it in, but the downside to using it is that if you spray it heavily in one spot, you get like the marks inside the hoodie, like you're saying. Yeah. Exactly. So if you were to use mist, you would be, you get the same results of it spread out evenly, but it's in the air. It gets all of your press arms. It gets all of your everything. So, it's fucking gross. Okay, fine. But does it act like mist or does it act like web? Because web, I mean, mist just gets on because of the inside of fleece, you know, if you're using mist, it's just getting on the, maybe the surface of the inside. Whereas the web, it's exactly that. It's a web and it spreads more. And then when you, when you put your, you know, your hoodie down or, your, or whatever, crew neck and your fleece down, it gets up in and holds the fleece better. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it's exactly. a better, it's a better hold. So are you, it still works apparently. Otherwise you wouldn't Absolutely. be doing it. Yeah. He's just not, it's just not as concentrated in specific well, there's, spots. There's no trails. I mean, right, like, right. like, so when, like, I don't want when we spray a palette, like, uh, you know, like to, to have that same pattern on that hoodie. So this actually just helps. Like it, mm-hmm. it just kind of like, <clears throat> evens it out just kind of puts it in one spot. well next time next time you do it take a video and send it to me i want to okay. see it sure we'll do i understand it. i understand fully what you're doing like it makes total sense i mean I just, somebody was literally grossed out they really thought that some someone fucked up works at my shop right they? right right no i get it i would that that always comes up in the debate of everybody who talks about using any kind of spray adhesive versus just using water base on everything yeah um is it's the really marks good. left sure. in the hoodie yeah. Right. Like I was talking to my buddy from Acme and he was saying the biggest thing is he does a lot of band merch and he was saying that when he uses web on like a zip hoodie specifically that a lot of people will wear like a shirt underneath, unzip it all the way and just leave like the hoodie open. He's like, if you were to use web on that hoodie, every time you saw the hoodie open, you would see like the glue marks or whatever. on yeah, the hoodie. Right. So he was like, I can't I do that. that like I, right. He's like, I can't do that. I have to use water base. You just have to basically every four spins or something, scrub the pallets quickly and then go back to using water base again. But your method basically kind of eliminates that. So it's kind of like the best of both worlds. We we never have any issues. Like, and we always look too, because like, you know, the last thing I want to do is, I mean, turn a hoodie inside out and throw it through the dryer just to hopefully get rid of that stuff. Right. Right. You know, because I mean like spray or, uh, you know, uh, the spot gun remover will get rid of that kind of stuff, but right. the worst part, the worst part for me, I, I, I've honestly never had a customer complain about having it on the inside of a hoodie. Yeah, it does suck that it's there, you know, whatever. But uh, the worst part is if you spray it and then you accidentally catch the front of the hoodie when you're loading it or the cuff or something like that. And then it's yes. like all over the bottom. Exactly. I know exactly what you're saying. And it's every time I see that, I'm like, oh, that sucks. But it's like, go spray it out with a spot gun. Um, but still, it's just like if you catch it. Now, right, if you most people are at the end of the dryer or your 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 assistant is looking at the print itself. But right. like the one thing that sucks is when the actual adhesive starts to build up on the the nozzle, and then you're only shooting one like giant like like a spread. perfect stream. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the worst. Like so, it's not like spreading out like it's supposed to. Right. You know, when it starts to like really just kind of concentrate in one area, that's when shit. Crush shot pack for you, so. Every time you're done using it, hold it upside down and spray it like for about three yeah. seconds in your, in your own hair into your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, uh, it'll clear it out like for the next time. <laughs> um, yeah. but nobody, it's not that we do that all the time, but whenever I remember to do it, I do it. I'm going to try to tell this story real quick without naming the shop. But again, it's one of those where you could probably guess it's one of those shops where they, uh, don't they have a lot of employees and don't care about their customers and they're kind of spread out across the U S and they work two shifts and all sorts of stuff. Well, anyway, um, 
a buddy of mine was telling me about the shop that was like that, that was near him that ended up closing down. But he was just saying like the kind of people that they hired there were like, you know, people fresh out of prison or, you know, people that were working, willing to work for like super minimum wage, whatever. And he was always telling me these stories about like, he ended up hiring a couple of the really good people from there that just wanted to learn screen printing. They wanted to be in the industry, but they ended up not wanting to work there, came to his place. And it was just funny. One of the stories that we kind of always bring up here is like, I guess some guy came in one day and was ultra pissed off and wanted to quit. And he just fucking took like two cans of web glue and threw them in the dryer. Oh. <laughs> I was like, that's such a badass way to leave. Be like, oh yeah, fuck you. And like throw a can in. And uh, another buddy of mine that the old, one of the really old dryers that we used to have was a gas dryer. And he told me that he had to change the belt on it once because he accidentally did that. Like he tipped a can onto the belt and it ended up going in the dryer and exploded. It, it like blew, it blew a huge hole in the belt, but it also blew the panels off the top. I was, I was going to say. So yeah. this is a, that's a rule here. And hopefully it is at your shops also. And if anybody, Never set it whoever's on the listening, yeah, there's no setting a, a can of adhesive on it on the dryer. I mean, there's just we no. Have, we have, um, like, we have uh, cup holders. On same the here. Right. The magnet it's a magnet that sticks to the dryer. Yeah. But yeah, you never, every time I see it, like I make a big deal. Like I basically shut down yeah. the whole shop. Like if I ever see <laughs> Punch that. Punch the guy in the face. <laughs> yeah. Like time out. Everybody stop. Look what happened. Because. My can, thing is, is like. I don't even understand why you would want to set it behind you on the dryer anyway. Like you'd have to turn around every time to grab the can. Absolutely. It's like, we just set ours like on the M and R there's like where the micros are. There's that little gap that perfectly fits a can. And it's like on the head right before you we do, just we set do. it there and we pick it up, spray, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I've definitely seen people put like the uh, Harbor freight, like magnet cup holder on the side of the control panel and just like pick it up and spray. But yeah, we, we, we also have a thing where, uh, absolutely no coffee or any drinks on any kind of table that where shirts are going to go just because I mean, you have blood right. shirts, you spill coffee. There's no fucking way you're going to get that out. You know? And that's <laughs> yeah. going to soak up, in there. you know, somebody left a highlighter on a hoodie one time and it soaked through like to the, a couple other ones, it, but it was underneath. Okay. So it was underneath like, so it soaked up. Um, yeah, it was, it was insane. <laughs> we had, we had a girl who used to work here that worked in the office that went out in the shop one day and was like, we asked her to like help at the end of the dryer. And this is back before we had like the, the rolly fabric carts that we have yeah. now. We had like a big wooden box that was like under the dryer and everything. The main thing was that that box should be the cleanest fucking surface in the whole shop because that's what all the shirts fall into one day she was out there and she's like real short and she like stepped in the box to like get the shirts out i remember it was one of those things like everybody in the shop was like whoa whoa like like what are you doing like don't step your dirty ass foot in the box because then all the shirts that fall in are gonna fall like on your shit footprint right um so yeah it was just there was a printer here once that um came in the office and was talking to me and Joanne and I think somebody else was in here and he was telling a story. It was in the morning, it was before we started and he set his coffee down on Joanne's desk and it was like the worst coffee that was, it was like hazelnut, mint, cinnamon, something or other. Yes. And it was massive too, it was, it was huge. And he, of course he starts talking and next thing you know, it spills. Our office smelled like hazelnut, <laughs> mint, cinnamon for like a month, it was awful. And the same guy, also the same printer, actually partied at our house one time and threw up in our kitchen sink. <laughs> so, so yeah. I, nice. like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. But no, I got one more, one more dryer story. Uh, I had an employee for a while. It was actually the one that we had to fire that we were talking about. It was just kind of like the sour apple in the shop, but he, he bent down to get something out of the box at one point and it was perfect timing where the belt zipper landed <laughs> perfectly when he bent down and he accidentally touched his forehead to it and he had like a perfect <laughs> zipper scar on his forehead like and it i don't know if it's still there to this day but it was there for a really long time it literally just like burned yeah. like branded a zipper in his forehead because it was one of those he just perfectly timed bent down and fucking burnt his forehead not, secondly not okay. what are you drinking is that like um, well, <clears throat> so I don't have any preference. I, I do, I do like pure, <laughs> pure leaf unsweetened. Um, but this was at my house. This is probably from Aldi. Um, it's, a uh, T 
tea company banner. I don't know, but it's spiked. Like I, oh. I had like my, my weekend was just, I mean, you know, I was kind of nervous. I was <laughs> it's okay. Is Alex it's still right. there? Is Alex still in town? Is that the problem? No. Yeah, yeah. Al- <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. First of all, pure leaf. I tried so hard. I, Did. I love this drink. I still have it. And they fucking broke my heart this weekend. Yeah. This, in Dude, fact, they you, broke my heart. In fact, you went they like, broke my heart. triple hard this past week and contacted them. Like I was I, finally like, like, okay, I'm going to actually contact them. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to send an email just Instagram, to Instagram, like actual right. to the company. All we were doing before was mainly a joke on the show. Like I do love pure leaf. I do like it. It's my drink of choice if I have the option, but like it turned into a thing where everybody was tagging them and whatever. And, uh, I was finally like, all right, I'm going to like actually send them an email to their like marketing team or something and see if we can make something of this. Cause it'd be hilarious. Right. So anyway, even before that happened, we were talking about the other day, something. And like, they, they said, Hey, there on Instagram, they acknowledged us for the first they, time for the first time, yeah. like said something back. And we were like, Holy shit. Like, I sent it to Andy and Chad and we were like, Oh shit's happening. We were super stoked. We were like, and yeah, get, they get said, ready. I posted that picture of me that like Chad made where it said like, Hey, pure leaf. And I was like drinking and they said, Hey there. And then I wrote like this quick paragraph or whatever about like how much we appreciate them. And we love the drink and all this other stuff. Nothing, no response. I was like, this is so fucking dumb. <laughs> So I was like, you know what? Screw Instagram. It's probably just some hired gun there. That's just responding to people. Uh, or not responding at all. So I sent this like long email to them and they emailed me back and we were basically just like, we don't have time for your small potatoes bullshit. Rejection. Right. That was like, <laughs> that was my version. Obviously <laughs> they didn't say. Fucking goddamn tea. Right. right. Like I just wanted a six no. pack to say, Hey, they responded. They sent me this free six pack, uh, whatever, I, but they were I, just like, Hey, fuck you guys. Yeah. When I was like 16, like, you know what? I've, I've always like just tried to communicate with people. Like, so like, I love Murray's beeswax. Like I've always used it. Like you can find it in the, you know, the hair aisle of Walmart or, you know, dollar general, wherever it's like dollar eighty nine a can. Um, I sent them a letter saying how much I love their stuff. Like when I was like probably 19 or 20. Um, Cause like I, I, it wasn't an email. It was like a fucking letter. They sent me a case of fucking, Dude, yeah. and like i literally it, just so had this conversation amount that i use it I, I i used it for like five years so they yeah. lost me for five years dude i was i just had this conversation with somebody the other day that was a friend of mine who was at the shop and i was telling them at the time because i just got that email from pure leaf that fucking broke my heart um that when i was in like middle school one of the assignments was to like write a formal letter to a company like you weren't supposed to submit it you were just supposed to like, as a test, like write a formal letter, like you were, you were addressing, a, you know, a large company or whatever. Sure. Well, the thing was, is we had to pick something to do. And I was like in charge of, at the time it was like higher on a roll study hall or whatever. And they, they asked you if you want to do certain things. And one of the things I did was I was the guy who like went around with a snack cart and like sold to other, other study halls. Right. And like my favorite snack on the cart was famous Amos, like those cookies, yeah. like the little cookies. And I, I saw one of those bags and I was like, all right, I'm going to write famous Amos. So I came up with a fake name and it was Johnny McCormick. (laughs) And I wrote them a letter saying that I felt that they're, they were doing false advertising because the amount of chocolate chips on the cookies on the package didn't match anywhere near the actual cookies in the bag, like the amount of chocolate chips. Cause on the bag, there's a fucking chocolate chips everywhere. I mean, so I, anyway, I, I ended up mailing that letter. Like you weren't supposed to mail a letter. I ended up mailing the letter to famous Amos and they sent me like 30 bags of cookies. <laughs> and I, mean, I was just like, I wrote one fucking letter as like a 12 year old to famous Amos and they sent me cookies. We probably sold f- for fucking screen printers, like 9 million bottles of fucking pure leaf. And the, all I get is a, Hey there on Instagram. And then when I send them a heartfelt letter, they're like, Hey, buzz off. I mean, so I, I listen to every, every episode. Um, I have a, I have a lake house, you know, I, it's about an hour and a half away. So every Monday I usually leave about four o'clock in the morning to come back home. My wife's usually there with my kids still. Um, and like, you know, like they hang out there, whatever. So like I have the perfect time to like kind of decompress 
Because my, my, my commute's only five minutes. Anyways, I listen to every episode. He probably is our first. <laughs> he's probably the first listener on Monday. Like when it posts, you know, if you're listening to it at like 4.30 in the morning or whatever you just said. Like yeah. he is, he is the first four thirty five o'clock sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But like you guys do it at mi- midnight, I think. Right. Mm, yeah. It posts um, at, at midnight, but still, I don't right. know who's up, who's up listening. So I don't know. That's, that's cool. So you're the well, first some, somebody in a different country. No, there you go. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, Europe's five hours ahead, um, six hours ahead, something like that. Yeah. Um, I have, I have a buddy, black dog Inc in Australia who t- always talks to me about the episode, like super early in the morning, because for him, it's like, when when it posts, I think it's like six o'clock in the afternoon, and he's like just getting out of work and he like listens yeah. to it. So, yeah. Crap. Well, anyway, you you totally forgot what you were gonna say. Yeah, I did. I did. I did. <laughs> when it comes back to you, let it, let me know. I have a just question. Just bust in. Just bust. I got in. something. So, okay. I have a. I have questions for you guys too. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, we got that's coming up. Okay. Right on. So you now you have an auto reclaim. Yes. And our um, we have a big debate right now at our shop. Okay. And not just at our shop, but I think I think a lot of shops, because we get um, we got a lot of messages recently about you know like it'll it'll say something like you know I can't why do you still use tape, and um, you know don't you have you heard of tapeless screens, and so here's here's my answer or here's my question to tape or not to tape, and I have uh, I've I've started to run the numbers because I'm trying to decide like, am I doing this wrong? You know, because here's what we've got. So the, fa- now that you have this auto reclaim, the, the, the fastest part is pulling the tape off. We have, uh, we use PMI and it just comes off extremely fast. Next I have a part question about your tape process too. Okay. Uh, you're done. Okay. So yeah. tape is off and it's off in 30 seconds and we're, and we're moving on and we're going into the auto reclaim and, and that's, and that's fast. Um, the, the hardest part I think is getting ink out. Like, so using putty knives to get ink out. So when they come off press, we have to get all the ink out first. Right. And if you're sloppy at that, or if you get ink on the frame, that's the sucky part. Yep. And so that slows us down. So, um, I would say this, I've thought about it. I've thought about it a lot recently. So the one way to avoid using tape, because we already tried on 23 by 31s, we already tried to use the tapeless. This is going back about two years. We had every screen in our shop. Um, you know, with the extra glue, the elite package from Frank. And so we were like, okay, well, we, we don't have to, yeah, we don't have to use um, a tape anymore. We're going to go with the glue. And that, that worked for a while, but then it, it started to break down. And I want to blame that on our, ourselves because with the power washer, we started to break some of it down. And so it became a little unreliable. And so we started taping the backs of the screens, but still we would get ink all over the frame and it would take time, extra time in the booth as you're cleaning. And so I was like, well, maybe we're taping the wrong side of the screen. Like, don't we want speed? Because when you're trying to process a lot of screens every day, you know, all these things, tape or getting ink off frames or and getting ink out of frames it, they, they chew up a lot of time you know it's a big deal sure. my point is if we didn't if we got bigger frames 25 36s that gives no us tape. more room right okay no so we tape. got more room we could we could use maybe no tape but here's the thing we're using more emulsion yes. right we're spending more money on mesh because there's it's just more mesh and, and more uh, expensive screens more, more uh, the frames are more expensive and yeah. so is it really a savings uh, well, because and where's and where's your cost because is your cost pull and tape or is your cost the tape i guess it's maybe pulled, your question maybe pulled. your question should be what kind of tape because you're hmm. buying the fancy pmi tape well i want the tape to come off fast because i don't want to be fucking yeah, you can have it. tape that comes off fast it doesn't have to be the fucking like super expensive pmi tape I'm oh, buying man, I'm buying natural gum rubber tape, the clear tape that doesn't leave any goo on the screens or anything. It peels right off super nice. Is it, is it from a company like named BMG or something like that? I get mine from Uline. I buy it by the case. I just buy a couple cases at a time. I have it. Like I said, we used to use back in the day, we used to use, just use fucking packing tape or masking tape. And masking tape sucks. I wouldn't use masking yeah, tape. Yeah. And then we so started I using packing tape either. It's too right. thin unless you get well, thicker. Absolutely. Well, the thing even with packing tape is that we were having issues, yeah, where you would pull it and it would tear and then you'd have to fucking pick at it. Right. Right. But the biggest problem with the packing tape was that it would leave the glue residue on the screen. So when you dipped it or whatever, it wouldn't, you know, go to the, the, 
it wouldn't degrade that part of the emulsion <laughs> because there was goo on the screen. So anyway, we ended up finding out from somebody, I don't remember who, I wish I could tell them, but th that we would do this natural gum rubber tape. It's like a brown, the, the actual tape is clear at first, but if you have it in a whole roll, the, the roll is brown. Yeah. So anyway, we use that tape on our screens and it never leaves any residue. It never tears. And it's just on the I don't know, a couple of the bucks screen? a roll. Yeah, just on the ink side, okay. on the inside. So we're taping yep. basically where the scoop coater stops to and like half there and half on the frame. So if you get anything in the corner or on the frame, you peel it all off one thing. So wait, and also so too, when you tape your screens, obviously, I mean you guys both know this, but you start one side, put like a little fold edge on, and then go all the way around the clockwise or whatever. Right. So that way when you pull, you pull one piece of tape and not four separate sure, pieces. Sure. But tape. how much so you're buying three inch, right? Yeah. I think it might be two and a half. Mm. I can check. It's probably three. So if you're buying three inch how you still have some frame that's exposed yeah okay and so what happens when ink gets on that frame really really rare that that would happen i'm gonna look at this while you guys are talking go but, ahead um, i'm listening you have a giant uh, beam of light lighting up your face it's because i just turned like my on monitor on pulp fiction like you just opened a suitcase i opened the gold oh suitcase God, it's a <laughs> um so so i think that i came up with an idea okay that as a workaround that I can, you talk about coming up with ideas, you know, I, I, we, I do this all the time, but unless I execute and idea is shit, like I got to do something about it. So I was going to call PMI and I was going to say, Hey guys, build me this, you know, make manufacture this for, for me, because I, I don't want it to, I want, I don't want to have to, we tried this, we tried using four inch tape. It's no good. It's too, well, for one, it's more money, more waste. Cause I want to cover more of the frame because I never want to mess. I never want to have to clean anything off the frame. I want to go like this. Step one, putty knife out ink. Step two, pull tape off. Step three, auto reclaim. And then that's it. Right. And so I don't want to ever have to worry about getting ink off the frame. The auto, the, our, our auto reclaim will get ink off the frame to an extent, but if it's bad, you know, if it's like everywhere, you're going to have to send it through a few, like more than one time. And I don't want to avoid that. And so I came up okay. with this idea because I want, I want the tape to extend past the frame. Like, you know, I want it and I don't, I don't want it to just cover to the edge or something. I want it to come past. So whenever you're carting or whatever, whoever's being sloppy or whatever you're doing, cause you're moving faster, if you, or you're loading ink or whatever, and you're getting ink on the frame, just to avoid that. I came up with the idea of cardboard. Like why, thin. I, I'm not trying to rag on you in any way. This is a serious question, but why are you getting so much ink on the, on the frame? I was going to ask the same question. Cause I almost never get ink on the frame. Like and, and like rare every screen, that, we get every ink screen on the that comes off press goes right to reclaim. How you many, how, what size frames do you have? 23 by 31. And yeah. you? No, you Same. have both. I have both. I have 23, 31 and 35 or 25, 36s. But I'm just saying like, it's rare that we would get ink on the frame. Like we're putting in enough ink to run the job. And then when it's done, they're pulling the screen out and then using a spatula or whatever to scoop all the ink out. What size squeegee do you then, have? They go, they go right into like, you know, the 16 are your, No. Are your 16 Go right to D-tape and then right into the machine now for us. But like for us, it was like, it just goes right to uh, the reclaim room. I think your guys, your printers are just being super sloppy with ink. Maybe you should just tell them to cut that shit out. I'm telling that tomorrow it. morning and say, here, I got, I figured it out. Dylan figured it out. <laughs> yeah, you guys are just fucking slobs. Well, I mean, so, okay. So perfect, perfect example. My, my stepson came and worked for me, um, two, three weeks. He, uh, he was off school obviously. And, uh, you know, first thing I had him do was peel tape. Well, he didn't know any better and he's just peeling tape and like ink is all over his hands. So he's grabbing the frames, but you don't train somebody to, to not know that. Like they think it's just a messy part of the job. So, that was like, okay, cool. I have a new process now. Here's how you clean a screen. Here's how you take ink off of a screen. Um, you know, you, you, you scrape it into this bucket. You don't get it on your hands. Don't have it on your hands because everything you touch is contaminated. So for your left chest, your, 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 your taper for the screens tapes the whole bottom. Why? It's such a waste. Like just do the top and where the squeegee's probably gonna hit in the flood bar and that's it. You know what I'm saying? For left chest, um, 
usually don't tape the bottom, like you said. I mean, you would you don't have to, right? But I think he's extra cautious because of something that happened a long time ago. One day, you know what I mean. So I sure. think he tries to just. Well, avoid... I'm not shitting on you, man. I'm, I'm right. just saying, like, you know, I we just we normally just do top and sides. I just agree. Because most doesn't fill the whole no. screen. Up. But we're yeah, taping we're taping every screen the exact same way. Uh, we're using two inch tape. And we're just taping the inside of the frame just so, I mean, and this was, this was pre Frank too, with the whole like caulking, but like even just to avoid getting ink in a hard to reach place in the corners, we're just taping every frame. Yeah. A, so it, so we're getting the, the open mesh where the emulsion didn't hit. Right. But are you um, coming, how far are you coming up the wall of the frame? Like the inside of that frame? half inch, Halfway? maybe half inch. I mean, our, we have, we have an auto cutter too. Um, and like it, it, it almost comes to the exact point where you put the tape and then like it is at the top of the, of the frame. But like, right. I don't know. We, we're, we're, doing use, probably, um, we're doing probably like 75% of the tape on the screen and then 25% of the tape on the frame. Do you use but winged like said, uh, really, flood bars? Really, yes. Yeah. Wing flood bars. So, so it comes past, it's, it's like bigger than 16 flood. inches, you know, it comes past. Yeah. We right. have both too, but it comes right. past the squeegee. Yeah. But the ink's not going outside of the wings. The ink's going on the inside. Um, what's, so your, what's your guys' normal, uh, like your your typical uh, your your run job? Like, what's your average um, shirt job? One well, I think I think the shirts. question I think the question that you're trying to get to is like, how much ink are you putting in? Like, are you one of those guys that's like, okay, this is a you know 200 piece run. Are you putting 200 piece run worth of ink in the screen in the beginning? Or no, are you no, stopping th- and putting in no. like half what, an What hour? I'm asking is like, if you guys have a really long run, shit starts climbing. No I'm with what. you. You know, I, I, I'm okay, with you. So, so I'm saying if like you normally do a hundred pieces. So, so for our shop, our minimum is like, <laughs> we, we did the math. It's 66 pieces. We, does that not mean we do a thousand pieces? Absolutely. Or 10,000 pieces. Uh, uh you know, that's another conversation we'll have in a little bit. We, t- we, like, taped, we tape a 10,000 piece run differently than we tape a, a 66 piece run though. Right. We okay. know that hey, if we're running, uh, the sh- if we have a large run, we're going to tape it a little better, a little different. We're going to tape both sides too, just in case, you know, because the last thing you want is. And you have backup screens too sometimes, just in case. Sometimes. But the last thing you want is to, is to have a screen breakdown um, and not, and not catch it for a hundred or whatever, 200. Sure. And so. We, and when we're going into a larger run, we tape it extra. But I would say that I think it's a combination of things. I think it's the fact that um, our runs range all over the place from, you know, 25 shirts to, 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 to thousands. Sure. But um, I would say that, I would say that um, it's probably a combination of things. It's probably being sloppy. It's probably loading too much ink. It's that there's not much room on the sides. It's when we card out and putty knife out. And it just, not every screen is trash. Don't get me wrong, but you know, out of, out of the day, you know, out of a, let's say you have a hundred screens, there's a solid third of them that need attention. Now you can't just pull the tape off and then they're fine. There's a third of them that need something. Absolutely. And so, and that's a problem. And, um, and I, well, that's why thing, I'm asking is cause I don't know how to get out of it other than tape all the way up the wall of that frame. Or, um, like I said, I've come with this idea of this really thin cardboard. They make this card out. They make this cardboard for screen printers. It's white. It's like a square. I'll go grab a piece. And it's, um, and it's smaller than our other cards. And I thought if it just, you know, set in your screen, this piece of cardboard, and then came up over, you know, taller and like taller than your frame. And then you tape that, that thing down that it would, for one, it's cardboard, it biodegrades, you don't have to worry about the environment as much. And then two, it comes out fast, you know, cause you know, like you said, tape can sometimes stick wrong or whatever, and it would protect your frame. And so, cause all my goal is my, my, my primary goal is to when, when the screen comes off press is to be as fast as possible to the ecotex. And when, you know, and so I want to get, I want to putty the ink out. Like I said, step one, step two, get the tape off the frame the screen in the frame and then go into the ecotext. I don't want to fuck around with it in the booth ever getting ink off of a frame. Cause that's then, you know, like it defeats the purpose of this auto reclaim. Like we're super fast now. We can reclaim hundreds of screens a day, but we're screwing around with some ink on a frame. And I hate that. How long is the the application process for this um, cardboard? What's, what's the uh, disposal like? And like, I mean, 
you know, can you reuse it? Um, is it, you're adding more waste to everything because everybody wants to be really sustainable right now. Um, you know, what's, what's your thoughts on that? I think that you're, um, well, which is more wasteful is putting your, putting your frame in a, in a booth and spraying a bunch of chemical on it to try and, you know, get some ink, uh, off of a frame and, you know, and go down the drain or just a piece of cardboard that, like I said, it's not plastic, it's cardboard. But it, it's but it has freeze. It. it what? It has the it's ink on it though. Well, I'm going to putty knife out. Like I said, I'm going to get most I'm of the ink off of it. Stuff. Yo, no, no, you, no, please do. Like, it's fine. There's so much like, shitting right now. I'm throwing this idea out there and I'm looking for, you know, somebody to say that's a stupid idea and here's why. So go for it. Yeah. My, like, you can. my biggest, my biggest thing, like I said, not ragging on anybody in general. I think the biggest thing is just where you're cleaning it, the screen out. Like if you're cleaning it on press or right next to the press, like the operator's cleaning it, or if you're taking a screen full of ink, setting it up on its side and having someone else no. do it on another table. No, it's going or, on a rack. Like it's or not. it's just, like I said, like you said, somebody's just being sloppy. Like, like I said, we're, we're basically uh, either cleaning it out on press right then and there with uh, a spatula or there, we have this table that I made by each press. That's basically like the tabletop. And then on the side of the table is a two by four. Yep, that's, that's like exactly just, just big, a little bit bigger than we the frame. So you can put the corner of the frame in it and then it's, it lays out flat to where you yeah. can clean the whole screen out nice and easy. It doesn't touch the surface of the table. It doesn't touch the table at all. Right. It just hangs there. Um, but again, it's like once, once that's done, it immediately goes from tape being pulled off to setting over by reclaim, ready to go in the machine. No, we, so no like when we, nothing. Like, so before we got the auto reclaim, we have a a giant flat table um, and pump systems um, with 55 gallon drums that we like, you know, spray, you know, that kind of thing. Um, But like the way we detape and, you know, do everything we put on that table, like kind of like what you were saying, like, but we have two, two by fours just so there's like a divot in the middle. Um, But with the auto reclaim, there can't be any globs of ink whatsoever. So I think that's the difference. I think that before we didn't notice there was a little ink on a frame. You know what I mean? Like there was chunks of ink because we went into our booth and we were in there anyway. We're in there anyway in the booth and we're, we're spraying our 701 and we're using our scrub brush and we're going to hit, if there's a little bit on the frame, we hit it. You see what I'm saying? So that's fine. With auto reclaim, you don't ever want to do that. You want to pull the tape off, put it in the machine. Sure. And so what right, I'm finding exactly. is, is a third of our screens need attention. And I don't want that anymore. I want right. to just go into the auto, I fully get, auto I reclaim. I fully get what so you're saying. I'm going to grab this piece of cardboard. And before you shit on it totally, I'm going to grab this piece of I'm cardboard. I'm not shitting on it. Show, hey, hold on. Joe, Joe, just let him get up. When he leaves, we can talk all the shit we want. He's got to go diarrhea, just like you yeah, said last He time. has to fucking, he's <laughs> such a weak stomach. I'm just kidding. I, I'm, not, he I'm not. He can't debate anything without getting diarrhea. You know these cards right here? You've seen these before? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I do these things on. Okay, there you go. Little, that card. With right? the little butt cheeks in the corner. So they're kind of, I don't know what they got on them. Maybe a little wax or something. They're, sm- you know, they're yeah. glossy somehow. And so like, I think like the ink wouldn't, it's not going to absorb ink on, in other words, you know, like it's, it, it, it'll repel it. And so check this out. If you had that card and you bent it and this, and like this, and this plopped down inside your frame, right? And then you ran tape right here. That would protect your, this part would protect that frame. I just feel like so, it, you'd end up with so much waste. Yeah. You'd end that's, up with so that's much what, what, what is tape? Like you use I'm tape not saying already. your tape, you, your cardboard, the actual cards or the cardboard strips, you would end up throwing away a million of those. Okay. So I don't want to use tape or cardboard, but I, that means I have to get 25 by 36s and then I'm going to use more emulsion and more. You're going to use way more See, I'm kind of back to the. Yeah. I don't no, know. I, I, don't I fully get, get it. I get it. I, I'm with you, man. I texted um, Frank I'm the other day. I'm like, hey, can I, can you get me the same tension on 25 by 36 as you do on 2331? And he says, yep. Thanks guys for the support on this. Um, Sorry, look for, man. look for my new product coming out. I'm going to partner with somebody and, and it's going to revolutionize the screen printing industry. Until he gets oh. shot down by the tree huggers because he's killing 9 million trees because he's throwing away all that cardboard all day long. Well, it's like paper or plastic. Which is better? When you go to the grocery store, which is better, paper or plastic? Neither. <laughs> all right. Well, um, all right. So next shop purchase. 
Um, <clears throat> it can be big or small. It can be like a hundred dollar purchase. Okay. All right. Um, or a fifty five hundred dollar pur- purchase. Purpose. <laughs> <laughs> you knew that was coming. Well, okay. So I guess my next shop purpose or er, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so now that so the way things have happened here, it's like we have screen reclaim like way over here. Mm. We have screen making over here. Um, just because of a controlled environment. Um, but I think when Alex was here and Alan, they were like, just move everything over here. And so it makes sense. So we have like all of our baker's racks. I call them baker's racks, but like baker's racks, racks. racks. you know, each press. So every screen goes in there. Our process now is everything gets moved to detaping and scraping ink off and then goes in the room and then goes into, you know, uh, imaging now like reclaims over here, which is a lot of, a lot of steps. So I think what we're going to do is probably just move everything over here and I'm going to, you know, make some walls and. So it's more of a, more of a project like, uh, than a purchase. It's more of a rearranging thing. Yeah, Which obviously, cost. Right, but I feel like that's I feel like that's just as important as a purchase. Is, well, yeah, I mean, like, I don't, there's nothing here that, that I think I. Well, I I just bought like uh, the double sleeves for the the Volt. So, I mean, that's coming. So I just bought that. So I mean, that, I guess that was one of my things. And like, did you make sure when you bought that to get the clamps that go on the bottom? Well, absolutely, that's the correct clamps. Yeah, it's like because when I got them, it was a beta thing and they never sent me the clamps. And then I one of my things with the beta was telling them was like, hey, uh, I'm having issues with this. He's like, oh, didn't we tell you we made the clamp for that? And I was like, no, you didn't fucking tell me. Like, that's why I'm telling you right now. It doesn't work. From Manitol? No, from uh, Action no. Engineering. Oh, no, no. This is not from Action Engineering. They, oh, they so you're that. getting dual sleeves. I'm getting it from the company. Oh, like, okay. as soon as I saw this, I was like, oh, okay. Cause like all the sleeve pallets, like they're very wide and like, you can't put them in a pocket. So I was, uh, when I saw this, I was like, okay, cool. So I can use this for a pocket print and, you know, double sleeve print. And like, we actually have three double sleeve print death metal bands we're doing this week. But like, I wish I had them, but you know, I don't know. Yep. So that, I guess that would be my next purchase other than, uh, changing out that room. All right. I think Got it's it. smart. I think flow is flow is super important. So you should oh, yeah. get on that. Absolutely. Like yeah. I was like racking my brain, like how, how do we fucking do this? Like <laughs> we grab old, you know, have a clean rack, dirty rack, you know, back and forth, like but like so many steps just sucks. <laughs> yeah, we have to do some rearranging here too. And I'm just trying to Last week, I just didn't have an Emmy because I know once I started, it's going to, it's a big project, you know, moving stuff around. And so, uh, but I think this week it's going to happen. So yeah, that is, it's an important thing too, because we have, as we've grown, just like you were talking about, we added each uh, section, then all of a sudden it doesn't, it just doesn't flow right anymore. And so we got to, we got to change it up. Um, And this is the perfect, like perfect month to do it. So um, before we get too busy again. All right. Any uh, shop hacks for us? Well, other than, uh, you know, this, we other have, than cards. that was a good <laughs> yeah. one. Though. I really that like that. Good. One. Oh, cool. Right on. Um, <clears throat> do you guys ever use these, um, at the beginning of your dryer, just in case anything happens instead of yelling down the dryer, Hey, this shit's fucked up. <clears throat> <laughs> so I have, no, uh, but no, but I have a me. card like this. And it has um, a color on it and it says what happened. So it'll say um, hole or it'll say, you know, ink. It's like, it'll say spray out. Sorry. So there's one that says hole and you just take the card and throw it on the shirt. Or there's one that says spray out and you take the card and throw it on the shirt. Or there's one that says something else. I'll have to go grab them. What, what, what if you have a bunch of different like uh, spots? Like, let's say you have like a hole in the sleeve. So you put a thing there and like the person at the end of the dryer, when they see that it's a red flag or like, uh, you know, a little dot right there. 
like I wanted to make it specific instead of just, um, we used to have something I'm not trying to shit on your system. <laughs> sure. No, we, used to, yeah. we used to have something where we would just put a, like you said, like a sticker on it. And they then, because I didn't want to yell down, just like you said. So they say, what's wrong with it? And so we always, we wanted it to have Nobody say, specific, it. like spray out whole <clears throat> misprint, whatever. So that goes on the shirt. I think then, the key is to just never have issues. Like, why do you guys have issues? I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, like, so when you come down here and train us and, and show us how that, how, how to be more like upstate, Right. Uh, I don't have, so, I, I don't, I, I don't have a method, like a sticker method or anything like that. You know, what we do is like with the split belt or even with our old dryer where it was one just wide belt is if one job's going down the dryer, you know, obviously they're usually like in line with each other, like on the belt, one right after another, we just throw that shirt or whatever that has an issue on the other side of the belt. Mm -hmm. So it goes down separately and lands in the bucket with the other ones or if the person at the other end of the dryer sees that there's like a random shirt, not in line with the rest of them. Then they know that that shirt has something wrong with it. While we're while we're running though, we want quality control at the end of the dryer to um, to call over at receiving and get us a fix. So like, let's say you have a hole in it. Well, we have stock here to pull from. Right. Or same thing. I'm just saying out. that they they know that there's cards. something wrong with that shirt. I have. Oh, so they're pre-made cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, um, and so we have a bunch of these, and you just drop it on the shirt, spray out. Oh, okay. So for the people listening to this podcast, Andy is holding up cards that say oh. hole or spray out, but they're pre-made cards. See, when you told me first, I was thinking that somebody had to quickly write what was wrong with it and then throw it down the dryer. We but do that too, it. but it's more like fuck off. We'll write yeah. on there and then send it down, you know, <laughs> right. stuff like that. But And then I mean, when they look up at you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know. That's a really good, I like that shop hack, you know, and then it's it helps when you, uh, if it were a spray out, this is, so I guess the bad thing about these is, is when we throw it on the shirt, it's not, we usually try to get it by the spray out, but like you, you could put a well, sticker sure, right you there. Have 12 shirts before they fucking enter the belt. Yeah. I like yours. You know, you put the arrow on there and it points directly to where the spray out is and then boom. I, I want to ask you guys right a question. Go, yep. ahead. Go with your questions. One thing that I'm really interested about is, uh, why Andy on this podcast? <laughs> oh dylan yeah. that um, <laughs> oh god that tickled me i have a I, I have so many questions actually but like i know we can't get to it um no ask them this is my I, favorite part I, of the show I, honestly is I, when we I, ask I, questions um pick your favorite what's the hard what, what's the hardest thing you face as owners employees that's easy for me. Yeah. The hardest but part like, of I mean, like, being a business this owner. Is personal too. Like, is it uh, meetings? Is it, uh, you know? No, like I love everybody here. And I've talked about this a hundred times about how everybody here is more like family and we're a close knit group and everything else. Like everything here is great with the people. It's just the problem of being a business owner is you're like you said, you're constantly trying to figure out like, like systems and processes to cut down on things or to make things better. But the one thing you can never count on is like human emotions. Like, Oh, sure. You know, like you might have one employee that comes in that day that like broke up with their boyfriend the night before. And then it's just like, a, they're in a bad mood or B, all they want to do is talk to every employee that goes by them that day about that issue. And then you have four people stand in a room talking about something for 45 minutes when they should be working or doing something else. And it's just like, that stuff's okay to do it to a degree, but it's like, for me, it's like, as the owner, it's just like, there's, or like I said, somebody might have an issue with something with you or with whatever, and you have to deal with it. Like to me, I don't, I'm not a confrontational kind of person. I'm not, I hate it. I hate confrontation. I hate talking to people about stuff they should do on their own. Cause we're all fucking adults. Like that to me is the worst 100%. part when there's something, when there's something I have to talk to somebody about that you should already know the fucking answer to, or you should already be doing. And we're the same age and we grew up the same and we doing the same shit. And I have to fucking lecture you because this is my business. That to me is the worst part of this job. Um, everything else is fucking like I would is cake to me. What about like, you personally though? Like, like you and Andy, like, like, <clears throat> are you guys like, being a business owner, like, does it, 
you know, take away from your life? Obviously it does, but like, definitely. What is, I mean, like, so what, you know, for me, like, I, I'm not going to like go off on a tangent, but like, I want to be hundred percent on everything, being a good friend, being a good husband, being a good dad, right. being a good leader, you know, all that kind of shit, like eating good, exercising, you know, whatever I can, but like being a business owner takes away from that kind of stuff a hundred percent of the time when you're trying to be a hundred percent all the time in right. every aspect. You can't be. I think I feel like I know. I've so everything, made... everything like suffers, you know, I might be a shit dad one month. Not, not I'm, I'm never going to be a shit dad, but, or, or temporarily, or, I, I get what you're saying. Like I'm with yeah, you there. Very there, temporarily. In every sacrifices aspect. as a business owner, you know, yes, we signed yeah. up, we signed up for this and, and some, yeah, some of us, we didn't really even know what we were getting into, but you know, it's, um, it's not easy. And so there's times where I've made sacrifices that, um, things like I have, I have tickets to opening day at the Cardinals or something, but I don't get to go, you know, because I'm stuck doing, putting out a fire, let's say. And so there's sacrifices like that all the time or kids things, you know, but not, sure. not, not every time there are sacrifices, but not every time. And so I think right. that for a while there, I think my work life balance was out of whack. You know, I was, it was too much work and not enough play, but, but over the years I've, I've got a way more where it needs to be. And so, so, you know, there's that, but, but there's always going to be something that comes up here at the shop that I'm going to have to not be able to do something I want to do. And that's, I'm, I have to be okay with that, you know, because yeah. there's a lot of responsibility having a business, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's massive, you know? And so it's, uh, I joke that, you know, we just, we're just here in this small building in this city, you know, in the state that, and we just print t-shirts, you know, what's come on. It's not really that serious, but, but it is a pretty big deal because there's so much people that work here and they have mortgages and they have families and, you know, and that's their career. This isn't just a, a temporary job. You no. know? We don't have Absolutely. that even, that's not even an option here. And no. so anybody that signs up to work here before they, before they say, yeah, I'm going to work there. I want a commitment. I want them to work. You know, I want them to work here. I tell them that there's people there that have been here. For I'm on your fucking side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like for real. And I, and I used to think a long time ago, I used to think that they worked for, for me, you know, like I used to have that attitude anyway, like you work for me, you know, um, get Shine off your phone, shoes. you know, this kind <laughs> of shit. <laughs> um, but I flipped that. I flipped that to say, like, I work for them. And so it's my job. It's my job because we don't have, we're stuck in that, in the middle of, we're too small to have a full-time HR person but we're, we're too big not to really, you know, we really do need, we really do need somebody like constantly working on, on HR. But um, that's me, you know, basically that's me because I've tried to have somebody help in the past and it's just really, it falls on me. And I do, I do my, I work at finding the right, the right person in the right job. And if something's going wrong, then let's talk about it. Like, why don't you, what, what's up? Like, is it something in your personal life? Is it something here? Tell me about it. And we need to talk about it because if they're not happy for consecutive amount of days or weeks or whatever, then, then that's going to reflect on their job performance. And so I want to sure. figure out what's going on. And if we need to move you into a different spot here, or if you need to just not even be here, you know, if this is a wrong fit for you, then I understand that you're not going to hurt my feelings. Maybe it's time for you to go, you know, you need to go grow. Right. And so I don't know. I think the hardest thing, I think Dylan's right. The hardest thing is, is per, HR per because we're, we're human beings and we have, we're complex and we're emotional and it's easy to figure out a fucking machine, <laughs> you know, like it's, you know, like there's usually you can problem solve through it. It's the hardest part. <clears throat> yeah, it's hard, man. So, so I don't I know. I think the hardest part, I think the hardest part for being the business owner and being a human being yourself is that like, and this happens to me all the time where like I could have a great day, like a Friday, you know, it could be having a great print day. Everyone here's in a good mood, whatever's happening. And then I'll hear like a little bit of an information about how some employee was unhappy about something that I was in control of that shit will fucking eat at me all weekend until Monday. Because like, like I said, it's just, I, I don't want anybody to be unhappy. That's my biggest downfall. It's like, I have such a hard time, especially customers too. There'd be a customer that's unhappy with something. I literally won't sleep for three days because like, oh, it fucking bugs me so much. And that like, gets that gets me to my core. Like that, right, that, that's what that I'm saying. Is, it literally big. like, I it, usually when I hear something like that, I instantly start sweating and I'm just like, fuck, like 
this this is something I was in control of that that went wrong and it's affecting well, and somebody. Then at 6 and p.m. on on a Friday, you can't change anything. No, that's like, what I mean. That's why it sucks when it happens on yeah. Friday because that fucking eats me all weekend long. And it's just like I can't I can't talk to that employee about that issue until Monday successfully because like if I call them it's always like oh don't worry about it whatever whatever but then on Monday it's back to work again and they're like oh I want to talk about this issue and it's like I think well, um, I, always tell, I always tell my wife like you know she, she owns a salon and like you know for us if we fuck something up we have we have some time to order extras in or that kind of stuff you know we'll make the order right hundred percent. Or if like, you know, there is a spoilage rate, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, you know, but, uh, for her, like she, she's doing hair. Like, so if, if something's going wrong, like right then it's like, it's, it's right in front of everybody's faces. And like, I couldn't imagine right. some of that stress sometimes. I don't know. No, no way. I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to do that. It's like, it's like the same thing. Like I'll be totally honest. And like, I know there's going to be people listening to this or like, I feel the exact same way, but I would never say it out loud is like when you could have done a job a hundred percent and you know, it was good. They opened the good box. About it, but dude, my heart sinks every single fucking time Me too. a customer picks up and they open the box. And I'm just like, what in there did we mess up? Like what in there did we not account for? Are they not going to love it? Like a lot of times you could print it perfectly. You could do everything you were told, but the customer builds it up in their mind of what it's supposed to look like. Right. And then when they open the box, it's what it actually looks like. And it's not about being right or being okay. Well, this email said this, you know, blah, blah, blah. blah. No, it's like, right. Are they happy? Was it, it what they wanted it to be? Or yes, is it like exactly. above their expectations is yeah. what you want every time. And like I said, you know, you could have knocked that shit out of the park, but as soon as they open that box, there's always something of like, Oh, I wish the shirt was a little more green than I thought it was. Or yeah. like, you know what I mean? There's always something that it's just like, I know I honestly don't want to be here. Like when a customer shows up to pick up an order, I want to be the furthest from fucking this place I ever. <laughs> like that's the truth and it, yeah. like like you said it's just that to me is like nice for where i am is that i don't have a lot of pickups that everything gets shipped and i don't have to deal with that as much but that's the truth of it is it's just like you could do an amazing job but still just be terrified of that like what are it, they gonna think because it's like every like it's the airport face where like you know your ticket doesn't is not valid you're like like yeah <laughs> Don't you yeah. love it when the customer what, what opens the, the box and they jokingly say, these are supposed to be red. Yeah. And then, oh, just kidding. Right. Don't and then you, you have, and then you have a fucking heart attack. <laughs> oh my God. My, my throat stinks to my chode. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, like, it's the worst thing ever. Yeah. Ugh. It's not so what, funny. What other, what other questions did you have? Um, who taught you how to run a business? Nobody. The streets. Yeah, figuring that shit out on your own. No job you ever worked at gave you any kind of like inspiration. Oh, I guess I built like I'm. So it's it's true that my entire life I I drew from all the experiences my whole life, right? Yeah. But about but, saving money, doing. I mean, I, I'm talking anything, man. I think life experience with the money thing, like having money, not having money to getting money, and then because that's pretty much what happened is I didn't have any money growing up, and I didn't have any money when I started the business, I just got together what I had and circumstance and ended up here. But like I was successful with business and I got a good amount of money. And then for a long time, for a couple of years, I was just fucking blowing it. Every time I had money, I was like, oh, I'm buying this. I want, I'm buying this. I want, and then I would have no money. And then we would have a slow month and I'd be fucked and I would have to scramble to get money or together or sell something or whatever. And it's like, that made me learn how to be better with money, which is where I'm at now, where I'm way better with money than I ever was. I am myself know that one of the best things that ever happened to me was when I was like 15, 16, and I worked at a grocery store is when I worked there, I didn't ever want to talk to anybody. I just wanted to do my job. I was kind of always shy growing up. I never wanted to go to like people's front door or knock or call anybody. You know, I was very shy like that, but working at the grocery store, they, they basically told me at one point, like, Oh, we need you to stock stuff, but we also need you to run like that fourth register. You know what I mean? When there's always like, Oh, I'm open on four because they needed extra people. Um, that's how it was where I had to open that register. And then I eventually just started talking to all the customers. You know what I mean? They're coming through line and you're like, Oh, what are you making? Or what are you doing? And it's like that. It's like that, uh, SNL skit with the target lady where you're just like, ah, what is this? You know what I mean? It's like, 
I just eventually got more comfortable talking to people and it was because I was forced to, like I had to ask them actual questions and I had to talk to people. So I feel like that is my greatest asset right now for, for this company. Like that's my role is I can talk to anybody and I can, I feel like I'm just very honest and very open and whatever. I feel like I can easily have a conversation with any human. And my wife always says that too. Like everybody, you always get along with everybody. Like you can find something to talk about with any kind of person and just sure. like, like ha- make them laugh or like whatever. And I feel like I wouldn't have had that if I didn't have that experience. Like if I didn't work the register at the grocery store, I feel like I would have still be like, Oh, I don't want to talk to people. Or I don't want to call anybody. Sometimes all it is is asking somebody a question. Like, how's your day going? Right. Oh man. And that's really what you sucks. had to do with like person after person after person. It's just like ask them something or about their day or Andy, what did you have? You mean as far as uh, drawing from experiences or how, yeah. how I think, um, I think adversity at a young age or adversity in general, ever is is like is is really good i mean that's with my with my son i mean i've never made it easy for him you know so and there's times where he's hated that <laughs> but i want to think i i think what it's important son? um he's 25 wow yeah and he's 900 years old um, i had him yeah. when i was 10 so was, <laughs> but uh you know he's he's uh and so he's he runs production um at a different shop. He's a production manager somewhere because he grew up around screen printing, but, um, he, he, uh, you know, like, but the entire time he was growing up though, I, I tried to try to make it like, try to make it tough on him. And so just knowing that, well, maybe one day he may want to have a business or, or whatever, or just in life in general, you know, like n- never make it, never make it too easy. I think spoil him at a, at like age, two, like to maybe three or four or whatever. But after that, like, it's like hard. Right, <laughs> you know? right. And so, so yeah, he's had to deal with that. It was kind of the same way for me. So, um, I kind I, of, I'm, I'm super guilty of that. Like spoiling my kids, like, cause again, I didn't have stuff like that when I was a kid. And like, when they say they want something or into something, I like, I'm definitely guilty of getting it for them because I want them to like experience that thing. But it was funny. Like my daughter's eight and my son's 10 and like my son, like it was probably a year ago now, got to the point where I realized it was a problem that I was like getting him things or doing things for him was like, I can't remember what it was. Oh, it was, uh, we did irrigation around my house. We like dug it all out and we put French drains in. So I like water that runs off my house would go in the drains. And I think we spent like, like two grand on just like gravel or something. And, uh, my son was like, asked me that day if he could have something like he wanted me to buy him some video game or something. And, uh, he got pissed off that I said, no, like, like, no, I just bought you a game like two days ago or something. He's like, he's like, Oh, you, you know, just because dad makes all the money and dad's willing to go spend $2,000 on dirt, he can't buy me a fucking video game or whatever. And he like wrote it down on a piece of paper and like put it on the outside of his bedroom door. Cause he was like, so frustrated that like, like he didn't get something handed to him from that moment on. I don't buy them anything. Like, (laughs) like literally I told them both, both kids. I'm like, you can earn an allowance every week. Like here's your chore chart. You finish your chores, you do everything you're supposed to do by Sunday night. I'll give you 20 bucks. And it's like, if you want to buy something and it's 40 bucks, guess what? It takes two weeks to get it. Like that's how shit is now. (laughs) And it was just funny because it was one of those moments where like, it just clicked to me of like, I can't, I can't just get these kids things because then someday they're just going to think everything gets handed to them. And I'm like, no, you guys have to work for everything now. Sure. Yeah. With my kiddo, I just wanted to make him likable. It was my number one goal. And then also (laughs) uh, teach him how to be, um, teach him like, you know, the real world, like how it would be in the real world. You know, you drop them off in the streets too. (laughs) find your way home. (laughs) I do that. I take them into the city and I kick them out of the car and I say, if you come home, there's a meal waiting for you. If not, I guess I could make (laughs) a new kid. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But most of the stuff I've learned, um, like the bigger picture stuff, like the macro stuff about running this place, um, I guess has just been through experience, you know, through just trial and error, messing up, handling a, handling a situation wrong, whether it was with an employee or a customer or um, a distributor or whatever. And then 
saying, well, why didn't that work? You know, was it because it's something I did and then being real, trying to be really insightful about it so that it works better the next time, you know, in practice anyway, because maybe it doesn't work better the next time, but you improve slightly over it. And so I think that happens once you've been in business for, for, for a while, you know, you just, you've kind of seen a lot of it and you've messed up enough times that you have a, you have instinct also when something that is just brand new, like I've never seen this before, but I'm going to, you know, and, and a lot of it is people are like, well, they'll come here and they'll ask me, they'll come in the, in, in my office. and be like, what do you think I should do about this? And I, and I say, okay, I think we should do this, but I don't know if they realize that I'm just guessing, you know, like mm -hmm. I don't right. really know that this is going to work, but it's just, I'm just fucking guessing that it is. And you could have done the same mm -hmm. thing, but it's just my best guess. And what I think is important is, is that you make the decision, take your best guess. And if it's wrong, then just, you know, yeah, but you get correct. to own it. You own it at that point. I'll own it and say, I, Hey, this is the wrong right. decision. You know, like right. whatever we did is wrong, but then you have to learn how to like, just do the, you know, like, Hey, admit it soon and recognize that it was wrong and then shift to something else. Like correct it. You know what I mean? And adjust. I just want to put that. that I that's just the word I was looking that, for is just adjust. Yeah. I want to put that ax asterisk on this conversation and say that like, I definitely don't know the answer to a lot of things and I'm still learning every day. And to me, that's what the best thing about this podcast is, is we kind of just three of us always get to brainstorm. Like, what's the best way to handle this situation? And like, I definitely know a lot of things just from life experience and like street knowledge and stuff like that, like to this point in my life. And I'm happy to give that information to anybody that's still working on trying to get where I'm at. But there's a lot of things where I'm not at yet that like, I have no fucking idea about and I'm still well, trying to learn. And that's why, that's why I love this podcast is because like, <clears throat> there's no like, you know, some people like want to have a formula for every kind of fucking uh, answer. I will admit, I'll be the first one to admit I'm a dumbass and I don't know. Well, oh, dude, I mean, I love this podcast because like, you know, it, there's no like set answers. Like there's, we're, we're not scientists. Like, you know, obviously, you know, stuff that we normally deal with on a regular basis, like, like low cure ink, put it through, right. you know, different temperature, that kind of shit. But like, I mean, a bunch of other stuff too, but well, like, like, I think what you're saying is, is like, for example, with that tape thing, like our shop, we're experiencing some ink on a frame and for whatever reason in this, in this shop at our shop, that's occurring. And maybe yeah. it's not occurring at other shops, you know, for, for whatever reason. And so throwing that out there, you know, it's just, I think it's interesting to hear what, what maybe what you guys, you know, had to say, because what are we, you know, what are we doing wrong? Is it something that's, that we're doing, doing wrong or, is it something that we need to change, you know? And so, I mean, there's no, like, there's no and the nice luxury. The luxury about this podcast is me and you will talk about it. And then we'll get 35 people DM us with the answer mm -hmm. on Tuesday. Yep. <laughs> so or that's like, where we, where we get to be selfish is that we we're asking the questions and we have the platform and like an unintentional respond. consequence really. Cause right. I didn't even think about that. All yeah. right. So any more questions for us? Um, you get one more. It better be good. Okay. No pressure. Okay, so I know most of you guys don't do any kind of uh, outsourcing, but do you outsource? No? Okay. If not, why? I don't outsource for the most part because for I'm super... Printing, for screen printing. Right. For, if I had to outsource screen printing, the problem is, is that, well, I guess it's good and bad. The bad part is, is that if I didn't know anybody, any other printers, I would definitely never outsource. The good thing is, is that I have a lot of print friends all over the world, all over the US. So I know there's really good ones and I know there's really bad ones and I know what ones are good at things. So I've said that multiple times that like if anything ever happened and for some reason I had to start a new company and I was solo, I would know exactly, like I would go back to doing what I was doing from the beginning is just outsourcing stuff. I would know exactly what printer and what part of the country I would send stuff to because I know I, they're I guess good. this does have a follow up question too. And like, you can keep answering. I, I just, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah I if just, you ever get a, if you ever get an order in St. Louis, don't send them here. Don't send to Andy. Yeah. Like yeah, you already know. You right like, so he knows a lot of printers that are good. Knows a lot of them that are bad. And <laughs> who are we was, talking to? Was it barrel maker? And he was like, I yeah. would absolutely not. Send it. <laughs> oh no. He was talking <laughs> about live printing. Yeah. Yeah. No, don't turn it around. Yeah, I, don't say, it. I listen to everything. I listen to everything. Oh, I'm a, I'm a yeah. But yeah, just anything else that's not screen printing, like 
stuff that's like mugs or, you know, random shit. Like I don't like to outsource because I don't know. Again, it's that same thing. It's that fear of that customer opening the box and it not being what they wanted. Like, I don't want my name on that. I don't want my name on something that I didn't produce. I have no control over whatever. And that that's good and bad. I feel like there's a lot of shops that agree with me on that. And then they're just like, I just won't outsource that stuff. I don't care. I'll do screen printing. And if you don't have screen printing products, I won't do it. I don't want to, there's a lot of shops. For the same reason. Like, I don't want, I don't know. I know that here's what I would rather do. Like, I don't want to just mark up something, you know, 50 cents or whatever, and have somebody else do the work on outsourcing. And I know some people would tell me that that's crazy. You should do that. Right. There's but like when I got an order, I got somebody, con I had somebody contact me um, a month ago or whatever. And they said, Hey, I've got this really hot um, order. I need it done. And it's 12 color. Can you do it? And it was actually, it was another printer, I think. Yeah, it was another printer. And I said, well, we have a 12 color press. Yeah, can do. But it was not on a white shirt. And so we really can't do it. And so sure. what did I do? Sure. I called somebody with the 14 color, Dylan. And I, and I actually just sent the whole lead to him. Like I didn't say, yeah, I can do it. And then outsource it to Dylan. I just said, hey, Dylan, you have a 14 color press. You can handle this, take it. And, uh, and so like, I would just rather do that. And then if somebody, and it can, and, it, and that, and that's a two way street, like it goes both ways. You know what I mean? Then maybe somebody, I mean, kind of, I would never send anything what to if, him. What, what, if, what if it is something? You can handle? I mean, it's like a dead end road. I feel like. What is, what is your normal, like, what is your, see for us, like we, we do, we do uh constant like orders all the time for uh, like, you know, like uh clothing companies and that kind of thing. So my cutoff is like 10,000 pieces or less. I mean, sometimes depending on like our, our workload. What do you mean? I, your cutoff, I, I you that. won't print over 10,000 pieces? No, no, no. I, I definitely will. We have, but I have a, a, a partner that does it for us that prints like, or they uh, ship like in for free and or deliver for free in an unmarked vehicle. Um, cause like the one, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not sketchy, <laughs> you know, like you're saying it's like a, they ship blind or they'll deliver it. Yes, you, exactly. The customer will never like, know who, who it's coming from. Right. Cause like we have, we have about five customers that order about that many units every, you know, quarter, every half year, every year, just once a year, whatever. Um, so we'll just toss it to them. I mean, like for us, it's like, I don't like factory work, you know, like we have, right. we have customers that depend on us, like for a one to three day turnaround. And like, right. you don't want to spend a week or two on one job. No, I don't want to step over a dollar to save it or step over a yeah dollar, to save a dime. Like we have, we have all their stock in our shop, like for the normal customers who depend on us. So like, you know, that's not our wheelhouse. Like, you know, I, I don't want to do you know, I don't want a broker to call me and say, Hey dude, do you want to do 30,000 pieces, uh, eight color simulated process for 35 cents? And it's like, I'm not, I'm just not into that. Like, I feel like I get, I get asked that a lot by people, especially like on Instagram and stuff that ask me that question. And I feel like I'm a hundred percent okay with my answer and it's my shop and I can do whatever the fuck I want. So I don't care if you don't like my answer. Um, but I just want to be really good at screen printing. Like I started a screen printing business. I want to be, I want to print shirts. I want to be known for printing good shirts. I want people to come here for shirts. And there's people that I look up to that have shops that do everything. You know, they, they print fucking keychains. They make posters, they do everything. And some people do it really well. They have a mind for that. They have managers they trust to handle different departments. And like when I first started, one of the shops I looked up to that does that is like Jack Prince. And I think Jack Prince is a phenomenal shop and I, you know, would love to visit there someday whatever, That's but like, stuff, by the way. right. But anyway, Jack Prince, like, I feel like they're one of the places that does that and they do it really well. But like, I just don't have the capacity. I don't have the mind to be like, I want to do screen printing. And then next door I have a sign shop. There's and then nothing we also wrong, do Dylan. keychains. Like there's nothing wrong with being a specialist. I mean, you go to, right, but that's uh, what I'm saying is my business wise, I have no ambition to do a hundred things. I just want to no. do. A I'm, the, I'm, I'm the same way. I mean, like we're not, we're not geared for that kind of thing. I don't know. We, we do do contract work, but mostly it's for like embroidery shops that want to like, just throw us like 
hundred pieces. I'm or, with you. I mean, I think you know. we're all, all three of the same. There's nothing wrong with being um, a shop that also does, um, whether it's promo products or, or whatever, but that's just not who we are. We're a specialist. We, we are, that's what I was going to give the analogy of is doctors, you mm-hmm. know, there's heart specialists, there's knee specialists. Right, exactly. And just, we happen to be t-shirt specialists and that's all we want to mess with. And if you have an issue with something else, or if you want something else, then we're not that place. Um, yeah, exactly. Quick takes. Yeah. Um, we've got some. Dylan, you want to kick it off? Oh, yeah. Hold on. I got to pull it up. <laughs> uh, if you had a superpower, what would it be? Be invisible. Classic. <laughs> well, or, 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 no, nah, that, that, ah, it's a good one. See, I thought about this too. I thought that when I saw Andy's quick takes earlier, I thought about it and I was like, you know what I would really love to do is I would love to be able to fly. Like I would love to just be able to like jump in the air and like fucking take off. Cause then I could visit any I cool trust place it, I wanted that, to visit. That's, that's the only thing. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to drop from 10,000 feet yeah, because my fly really low. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but who, I'm just who's saying, like, tell you that you're not going to, though. Right, but that's the thing. I was like, you know what else I would really love is I would really love to be, like, I would love to be able to be like a couple hundred years old so that I could like experience like as much as I wanted to. So you know, I was like, who who lives to be really old can fly and do all these other cool stuff, and it's Thor. <laughs> Thor's fucking old as shit. And he can fly with his hammer and he's fucking good looking and no. he can be fat piece of shit no, for too. No. You can only be you ever watch one superpower. One superpower. Yeah, yeah, but if you were a superhero like Thor, you have the all those abilities because you're a god. Hmm. Well Did you ever watch Adventures Babysitting? No. No. What? I, I never <laughs> even heard of it. <laughs> like Yeah, I don't watch the CW. Adventures and Babysitting. You never watched that before. No. Holy fuck. You're going to have to now. It sounds like. Sounds, yeah. sounds like we missed out. Oh, yeah. You also got to watch Greasy Strangler. I, I feel like that. those aren't on the same channel. All right. So, you like <laughs> that All right. Favorite beverage. All right. So, I'm going to sound really fat right now, but it's uh, Diet Sprite. Chocolate. Candy. <laughs> I thought the same thing. Chocolate <laughs> milk, for sure, when you said that. Yeah. <laughs> no. Diet Sprite. Like, I'm going to sound really fat right now. Diet uh, Sprite again is my butter. absolute favorite thing in the entire world. <laughs> I drink You're a like, ton uh, of water, melt- too. But- <laughs> <laughs> no, melted butter. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to sound really fat right now. My favorite drink is melted butter. Um, yeah, you guys. The next question, the next quick take is he already kind of answered that. But, well, let's hear it. Which let's hear the what? Perfect size order. Yeah, perfect size order. What's the like the ultimate order that, that you want in your shop, size wise? I love a hundred shirts, white, white, black ink. But One hit. That's it. Like that's yeah. a sweet spot right there. Yeah. All right. Well, I have a feeling we're going to go down a rabbit hole here. Um, but yeah. favorite TV show as a kid? Wonder Years. Oh yeah. Forgot Not about bad. That one. Not bad. I forgot about that one. What do you mean not bad? No, it's fucking amazing. <laughs> no, I know. It's on my movie. I didn't know what you guys were going to ask me. And like, that was like, that was. <laughs> he, he was, he was in immediate. With I that follow one. Danica McKellar, who is Winnie Cooper. And, uh, well, Roseanne too. I love Roseanne. Um, but nice. yeah, I just, I love both those shows. Quantum Leap was my favorite show. I never watched it. That's awesome. Mine was invented. And I, I recently, I recently just acquired the full series. Like, I, th- I think it might be DVDs, but like I had like season like three and four for the longest time. And I finally found like a used version of all of them. So I'm excited to be able to go through them. What about you, Andrew? Um, let's see. I'm going to have to go with how oh, there's so many good ones, but as a kid, like a, like a little kid, Gilligan's Island. Well, Okay. It just reminds I love, you. Of I love me. that show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it was just so good. I loved it. When Andy um, was a kid, they didn't have TV. They only had the radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, when TV came out, when I was a kid, eventually, <laughs> yeah, it was Gilligan's Island for sure. <laughs> um, best drive-through meal, or your favorite place to get drive-through from? Are you talking about fast food or like mm, anything? Just as long Anything as you just got to drive, drive through. through. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
hmm. right now, not like as a kid or anything. Like right no, now. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Uh, so if I were to go right now, fuck with some stuff. Probably. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't really like fast food, but like, I really like rallies. I don't, do you guys have rallies out there? Yeah, we do. You do? No. We do, but I haven't been in, in years, so I don't know. I, I don't mean, know what they have it, anymore. It just kind of came. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I don't, I don't really go to fast food though. Like, but so much is drive through now. Um, but yeah, I, this is easy for me. You know what? I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to wake up in a cold sweat tonight and be like, God damn it. Why didn't I say this? This is easy for me too. <laughs> what right, you got that? Dylan? Chick-fil-A. Same, like no doubter. See, we have Chick-fil-A. I've, I've, never, I've never had Chick-fil-A. Well, you fucked up. We went and to we Chick-fil-A. Have it so um, <laughs> we went to Chick-fil-A like two weeks ago, and and so we pull up, and for the first time ever that I've ever been to Chick-fil-A, they hand me the wrong bag. Like so when we open it, it's the wrong stuff. I'm like, oh, you know, this is the wrong stuff. And the guy immediately started like shaking and like sweating, like, holy cow, the manager came fucking flying up. And I know like that was probably it. Like he's done. <laughs> like there's, there's, you're and out he, of here. Like they have fucking, no, there's no second chances there. He like fucking high kicked him. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a teenager, you know, they're like, oh God, you know, like everything shut down there. No, but for real, like I was the first time ever they did something wrong and they, but they fixed it fast, like super fast. And said, awesome. uh, I, I like Chick-fil-A, but Chick-fil-A for us is not because it's normally like a Southern kind of thing. Um, but there's, there's one Chick-fil-A near us and it's an hour and a half away. And there's days where it's like lunch and I'm like, I'm going like, oh it's God, a three hour serious? trip to get Chick-fil-A. So I drive an hour and a half, get oh. it and drive an hour and a half back. You got to buy it for the next day too, then like extra. Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. Anytime I go to Chick-fil-A with anybody here, they know automatically I'm ordering like six sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I want, or I want, you know, two originals, two spicy sandwiches and a chocolate shake. So, and there's times where my friends will be like going through Syracuse to like get something where well, that's where the Chick-fil-A is. And they'll just call me and be like, check your mailbox. And I'll go down to my mailbox at my house. And there's like four Chick-fil-A sandwiches in the mailbox for me. <laughs> so that's, that's dedication. I like that. Yeah. And you, and you eat them cold. Cold, <laughs> yes. Your Dude, I like yeah. cold, cold Chick Fil A sandwiches, which is funny because too, like uh, Alexis and Tyler uh, in house apparently get Chick Fil A like every other day, and like they, she's always posting her Chick Fil A, and she always tags me, and it just pisses me off that she's eating so much Chick Fil A, and I have none. We all we got What's left for is dinner. What, yeah, that's just that's the last thing. What's for dinner? Well, uh, my really? wife texted me, and she was like. <laughs> <laughs> uh she so she is like I mean she's a small girl like I don't know but she's like like on and off keto can you can So you're you eating that? you're eating brown rice tonight and quinoa is what you're saying and diet sprite No 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 I'm not eating anything, anything like that like she she was talking about like getting me picking up pizza but cauliflower crust mm -hmm. so like which is actually pretty good it's not bad um but I don't know so if that's not the case, I'm going to check my phone here when we're off this. And, uh, I might just pick up a uh, five stick, of, five sticks of, uh, butter teriyaki chicken from the Chinese place. And, uh, I don't know. Have you guys ever had that before? Like just teriyaki chicken. Yeah. On a stick. Yeah. Like a skewer, yeah. you know, like a kebab kind yeah. of thing, but yeah, yeah, for sure. I love it. That's mm -hmm. it. I don't want rice. I don't want yeah. anything else. That's so keto right there for you then. What about you guys? No, I'm I'm not doing keto. I'm a big oh, okay. dude. <laughs> Dylan probably already ate. Geez, it's like later there, huh? Steak and uh, asparagus, I think, is what I'm making when I get home. So your pee's gonna smell when you wake up in the middle of the night. Mm, that's okay. I, I like stinky pee. It looks I love it. I love it. Speaking of pee, Andy, what are you having tonight? I'm gonna exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure I'm gonna catch some shit for this. Split pea soup. What's wrong with mm. that? I don't know. Like, I love it. It's, um, but I haven't had it in a long time and I'm making it. So cool. you're splitting all the peas yourself. 
<laughs> uh, yeah. Um. <laughs> it's take a long time. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> My first job at the, when I got a job at this, um, St. Louis has a lot of microbrews. And my first job at this microbrew, when I, I, they actually said yes to me, I begged and begged to work there. And they said, okay, yeah, come on in. And they put me in the kitchen. And my job was to peel potatoes. Like it was the lowest on the totem pole, like the piece of shit job. Like here, go fucking peel potatoes for three hours or whatever. And so I, that's what I did. And I sat on a bucket and they came in buckets and we just peeled them. Well, then I was like, and this was for French fries only. That, that's what we made it for. And I'm like, why... I'm like, guys, guys, like, it's kind of a cool thing to have skin on fries. So let's just go with that. You could save, you know, three hours of me every day coming in here, peeling potatoes, and let's just throw them in there in the fry maker now. And it's like, oh, okay. And so that's why they have skin on fry. Because Andy was so now. lazy. And, and didn't I saved want to them. Do it. it wasn't lazy. It was a, it was a, <laughs> hey, I'm like, we're, I'm just, we're just wasting money here, peeling potatoes. Let's just throw them in the fryer. With the skin on and everybody loved it. And then they fired you because your sole job was to peel potatoes. <laughs> but he's good. He doesn't know how to do anything else. Get him out of here. <laughs> Look at this guy. This guy, first job? this guy right here, he's a potato peeler. <laughs> what was your first job, Dylan? Was it the grocery store? My very first job was the grocery store, uh, but it was a different grocery store. I worked there for like two weeks bagging groceries and I hated it. And then I left and then I was like, you know what I'm going to do now with my life? I'm going to work at a grocery store. <laughs> so I went and worked at another grocery store, but the best part about this one is it's one in my hometown and everybody I knew there, like I knew everybody that worked there. And it was like the place you work out of high school or in high school is this grocery store. And the best part is I made my hours the same hours as the manager who was actually a cousin of mine. And I never fucking listened to him at all. So it was like, he would always call like Dylan to the front and I'd be like, nah, what are you gonna do? Fire me, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one of the jobs where I just definitely was like, you know, a piece of shit and I got paid for it. So, but it was super fun. My first we would do, we would do shit like open like milk cartons and hide them in the store. So they would like get rotten and stink or like crack eggs halfway and like hide them up above the lights or something. So that they got real, real smelly. That's disappointing, Dylan. That's I was like fucking 15 years old. <laughs> I would still do that now, but still, it's like I was 15. I can use that excuse. All right. Well, my first job was also my first legal job. And, you know, like when I was 16, like real job that um, I was legal to do was at a grocery store. I bagged groceries. It was at a grocery store where they actually you bagged them and took them out to the car, like the to the to the customer's car. And um, so that was my first first legal job. But I did other stuff like cut grass and all that bullshit. Mopro. Um, yeah. I had a, had a lawn mowing business um, pretty early on, but yeah, that was, how about you? Um, working at a haunted house. I fun. was, yeah. It, I mean, I didn't make shit like when I was 13 um, because I wasn't 16. Uh, you were a character or something or what, what did you do there? Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I had my own room and everything. Like I wanted to be a chainsaw guy, but like, I wasn't old enough. You had to be 18. Um, so like I worked in this room and like, I always bring back everything to like Marilyn Manson. Like I, I, I used to be obsessed with Marilyn Manson when I was a kid, you know? So like, I mean, that's, gee, what it, I saw him in concert one time. Yeah, yeah. I saw him a bunch of times, but like, um, I never met him before. And like, I have a lot of friends who've met him who like, cause, cause we're from Ohio. He's from Ohio, you know, that kind of shit. Um, but like, I, so I worked this whole season at the haunted house when I was 13 and they're like, you're not old enough for us to pay you, but we can guarantee you're going to win the tickets at the end of the, you know, the, the season. So like, I didn't miss a day. Um, Is this some, some like Napoleon dynamite shit? They didn't pay you. They can't pay you. Cause, cause, cause I, cause like I, I was too young. They pay, they you're, pay you in like you're getting experience. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm serious. Like they, they can't even like give you like, I mean, they can give you like snacks and stuff like that. They can't give you money. Um, and like the way haunted houses work is usually you're not paid hourly. You're paid by like the whole season. And like, if you don't miss this, you don't miss that, you know, cause I stayed from, from 13 to almost 18, but like, um, but that first season, they were like, dude, you've been here every single day. So we're going to, you know, make sure you win the tickets for Marilyn Manson. So like, 
<laughs> so I won the tickets to see Marilyn Manson at 13. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. This is my second time seeing him actually. And, uh, was that your first con? Oh, so what was your first concert ever? It was Marilyn Manson, but Dylan, was, your first well, concert. Was, Goo Goo Dolls. <laughs> For real? What is it? Yeah. Or was it? Okay. That's cool. Goo Goo yeah. Dolls. Mine mm-hmm. was Def Leppard. Yeah. I saw Def Leppard not that long ago, like two years ago. That'd be a good one. I went with my dad. <laughs> yeah. What was the best concert you ever saw or show? Like, I, I don't even call shows concerts. Like, I, I just call them yeah. shows. No, you, yeah, you didn't. I, I've been to a million. So, I, but I mean, like, know, the best I, ever. I, I mean, who cares, like, how big or small it is? My mm. favorites were always probably like Every Time I Die shows or the Chariot shows. Because every time I die is from here, they're like from Buffalo. Yeah. So like going to a Buffalo show with every time I die is like the craziest fucking crowd ever. Like everybody's moving, like everybody's throwing everybody. And it's just so much fun. Like the most fun. And the same with like chariot shows back when I was in Atlanta. And Cause that's where they're from is from Atlanta. So like those hometown shows for those bands that were already my favorite bands anyway, like just seeing them in their hometown and seeing them often too. It's not like, like I've probably seen every time I die, like fucking 30 times. And it's like, it's just fun every time, no matter what, even if it's the same album, same thing over and over again. But I can say that like, cause those are crazy fun shows, but I can also say like the big, the best biggest concert I've ever seen was like Garth Brooks. And that was just because it was like, you know, it's like, it's Garth Brooks. Like it could be, they, he was just the biggest thing. And, everybody knows every song on the radio. So it was like, we have to go to Garth Brooks when he did like his world tour or whatever. Right. And it was just fun to go to like a, it'd be like going to see like, Oh, I went to a Beyonce concert or something. It was just like this huge spectacle thing. to yeah, go it was see. Fucking awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's that the end you answered that two different ways. Like one, where, where'd you have the most fun, you know, and mine would have right. been um, three eleven small venue, like early on and in, in those, in their, in their years. But the best concert, like it just sounded the best, and I was so excited to go to, would have been Nine Inch Nails. Um, I've seen them a few times, but I I had a comment real quick before we end this about uh, Marilyn Manson, and it was funny because, like, when I was a kid, we, me and my brother, were part of that. uh, What is it? uh, The Columbia House CD thing, you know, where you would like pay a penny and get like twenty CDs (laughs) or whatever it was. Yeah. How many times? uh, Dude, we did. We got so many fucking CDs from that thing, like know, over dude. and over and so, over and I'm over. I'm so over embarrassed again. by it, but yeah, yeah. So anyway, like I remember one of the things is I got Marilyn Manson CD, and that was the time when he blew up of like this huge thing with like moms. Remember, like it was like moms that went to court or whatever yeah. because like of his CDs and stuff. I remember my mom like watching that on TV. And then realizing that I had just got that album in that thing. And she, I remember she like lost, she didn't like lose it, but she was like concerned that I was into like Satanism and stuff and like, gra- take like took it away from me and yeah, oh. like locked it in a drawer and wouldn't give it back to me and stuff. And it was just like so funny because it was like we, we grew up in that and it was just like, it was just funny. It just reminded, it reminded me of that fucking Columbia Club. So we have a split pea soup still. I got to go home. I got to make it. I got to eat it. But this has been a really good one. I liked it a lot. Well, hey, Joe, I appreciate you coming on, man. And thanks for listening to all the episodes. I probably won't see you in Long Beach because I don't think it's going to happen. But uh, I think Texas will. Dude, we're pushing for Fort Worth, man. Well, let's keep in contact. Yeah, we will do. All right, dudes. Hey, see you, man. All right, see you, Joe.